please subscribe to my channel. Audio novels. See playlist for other chapters and novels. Credits goes to the author of the novel. I convert stories to audio book for mental health, for multitasking purpose, for accessibility and time saving. Listening to audio book is also beneficial for people who have disability. It improves our listening skills and improve our English comprehension, vocabulary and other things. So, thank you for listening. Thank you and thank you very much for your support. A Game of Thrones. Book 1 of A Song of Ice and Fire. By George R. R. Martin. Prologue. We should start back, Gaird urged as the woods began to grow dark around them. The wildlings are dead. Do the dead frighten you? Sir Waymaroyce asked with just the hint of a smile. Gaird did not rise to the bait. He was an old man, past fifty, and he had seen the lordlings come and go. Dead is dead, he said. We have no business with the dead. Are they dead? Royce asked softly. What proof have we? We'll saw them, Gerd said. If he says they are dead, that's proof enough for me. Will had known they would drag him into the quarrel sooner or later. He wished it had been later other than sooner. My mother told me that dead men sing no songs, he put in. My wet nurse said the same thing, Will. Royce replied. Never believe anything you hear at a woman's tit. There are things to be learned even from the dead. His voice echoed, too loud in the twilight forest. We have a long ride before us, Gaird pointed out. Eight days, maybe nine. And night is falling. Sir Waymer Royce glanced at the sky with disinterest. It does that every day about this time. Are you unmanned by the dark, Gaird? Will could see the tightness around Gerd's mouth, the barely suppressed anger in his eyes under the thick black hood of his cloak. Gerd had spent forty years in the night's watch, man and boy, and he was not accustomed to being made light of. Yet it was more than that. Under the wounded pride, Will could sense something else in the older man. You could taste it, a nervous tension that came perilous close to fear. Will shared his unease. He had been four years on the wall. The first time he had been sent beyond, all the old stories had come rushing back, and his bowels had turned to water. He had laughed about it afterward. He was a veteran of a hundred rangings by now, and the endless dark wilderness that the Southron called the Haunted Forest had no more terrors for him. Until tonight. Something was different tonight. There was an edge to this darkness that made his hackles rise. Nine days they had been riding, north and northwest and then north again, farther and farther from the wall, hard on the track of a band of wildling raiders. Each day had been worse than the day that had come before it. Today was the worst of all. A cold wind was blowing out of the north, and it made the trees rustle like living things. All day, Will had felt as though something were watching him something cold and implacable that loved him not. Gerd had felt it too. Will wanted nothing so much as to ride hell-bent for the safety of the wall, but that was not a feeling to share with your commander. Especially not a commander like this one. Sir Waymeroyce was the youngest son of an ancient house with too many heirs. He was a handsome youth of eighteen, grey-eyed and graceful and slender as a knife. Mounted on his huge black distria, the knight towered above Will and Gerd on their smaller grounds. He wore black leather boots, black woolen pants, black moleskin gloves, and a fine supple coat of gleaming black ring mail over layers of black wool and boiled leather. Sir Waymer had been a sworn brother of the Night's Watch for less than half a year, but no one could say he had not prepared for his vocation. At least in so far as his wardrobe was concerned. His cloak was his crowning glory, sable, thick and black and soft as sin. Bet he killed them all himself, he did, Gerd told the barracks over wine, twisted their little heads off, our mighty warrior. They had all shared the laugh. It is hard to take orders from a man you laughed at in your cups, Will reflected as he sat shivering atop his garan. Gerd must have felt the same. Mormont said as we should track them, and we did. Gerd said. They're dead. They shan't trouble us no more. 
there's hard riding before us. I don't like this weather. If it snows, we could be a fortnight getting back, and snow's the best we can hope for. Ever seen a nice storm, my lord? The lordling seemed not to hear him. He studied the deepening twilight in that half but half distracted way he had. Will had ridden with the knight long enough to understand that it was best not to interrupt him when he looked like that. Tell me again what you saw, Will. All the details. Leave nothing out. Will had been a hunter before he joined the Night's Watch. Well, a poacher in truth. Malister Free Riders had caught him red handed in the Malister's own woods, skinning one of the Malister's own bucks, and it had been a choice of putting on the black or losing a hand. No one could move through the woods as silent as Will, and it had not taken the Black Brothers long to discover his talent. The camp is two miles farther on, over that ridge, hard beside a stream, Will said. I got close as I dared. There's eight of them, men and women both. No children I could see. They put up a lean to against the rock. The snow's pretty well covered it now, but I could still make it out. No fire burning, but the fire pit was still plain as day. No one moving. I watched a long time. No living man ever lay so still. Did you see any blood? Well, no, Will admitted. Did you see any weapons? Some swords, a few bows. One man had an axe. Heavy looking, double bladed, a cruel piece of iron. It was on the ground beside him, right by his hand. Did you make note of the position of the bodies? Will shrugged. A couple are sitting up against the rock. Most of them on the ground. Fallen, like. Or sleeping, Royce suggested. Fallen, Will insisted. There's one woman up an iron wood, half hid in the branches. A far eyes. He smiled thinly. I took care she never saw me. When I got closer, I saw that she wasn't moving neither. Despite himself, he shivered. You have a chill? Royce asked. Some, Will muttered. The wind, Lord. The young knight turned back to his grizzled man at arms. Frost fallen leaves whispered past them, and Royce's distria moved restlessly. What do you think might have killed these men, Gerd? Sir Waymer asked casually. He adjusted the drape of his long sable cloak. It was the cold, Gerd said with iron certainty. I saw men freeze last winter, and the one before, when I was half a boy. Everyone talks about snows forty foot deep, and how the ice wind comes howling out of the north, but the real enemy is the cold. It steals up on you quieter than will, and at first you shiver and your teeth chatter and you stamp your feet and dream of mulled wine and nice hot fires. It burns, it does. Nothing burns like the cold. But only for a while. Then it gets inside you and starts to fill you up, and after a while you don't have the strength to fight it. It's easier just to sit down or go to sleep. They say you don't feel any pain toward the end. First you go weak and drowsy, and everything starts to fade, and then it's like sinking into a sea of warm milk. Peaceful, like. Such eloquence, Gerd, Sir Waymer observed. I never suspected you had it in you. I've had the cold in me too, Lordling. Gerd pulled back his hood, giving Sir Waymer a good long look at the stumps where his ears had been. Two ears, three toes and the little finger off my left hand. I got off light. We found my brother frozen at his watch, with a smile on his face. Sir Weymer shrugged. You ought to dress more warmly, Gerd. Gerd glared at the lordling, the scars around his ear holes flushed red with anger where Master Emmon had cut the ears away. We'll see how warm you can dress when the winter comes. He pulled up his hood and hunched over his garin, silent and sullen. If Gerd said it was the cold. Dot. Will began. Have you drawn any watches this past week, Will? Yes, Lord. There never was a week when he did not draw a dozen bloody watches. What was the man driving at? And how did you find the wall? Weeping, Will said, frowning. He saw it clear enough, now that the Lordling had pointed it out. 
They couldn't have froze. Not if the wall was weeping. It wasn't cold enough. Royce nodded. Bright lad. We've had a few light frosts this past week, and a quick flurry of snow now and then, but surely no cold fierce enough to kill eight grown men. Men clad in fur and leather, let me remind you, with shelter near at hand, and the means of making fire. The knight's smile was cocksure. Will, lead us there. I would see these dead men for myself. And then there was nothing to be done for it. The order had been given, and on abound them to obey. Will went in front, his shaggy little grin picking the way carefully through the undergrowth. A light snow had fallen the night before, and there were stones and roots and hidden sinks lying just under its crust, waiting for the careless and the unwary. Sir Waymeroyce came next, his great black distria snorting impatiently. The warhorse was the wrong mount for ranging, but try and tell that to the lordling. Gaird brought up the rear. The old man at arms muttered to himself as he rode. Twilight deepened. The cloudless sky turned a deep purple, the color of an old bruise, then faded to black. The stars began to come out. A half moon rose. Will was grateful for the light. We can make a better pace than this, surely, Royce said when the moon was full risen. Not with this horse, Will said. Fear had made him insolent. Perhaps my lord would care to take the lead? Sir Waymer Royce did not deign to reply. Somewhere off in the wood a wolf howled. Will pulled his gran over beneath an ancient gnarled ironwood and dismounted. Why are you stopping? Sir Waymer asked. Best go the rest of the way on foot, lord. It's just over that ridge. Royce paused a moment, staring off into the distance, his face reflective. A cold wind whispered through the trees. His great sable cloak stirred behind like something half alive. There's something wrong here, Gaird muttered. The young knight gave him a disdainful smile. Is there? Can't you feel it? Gaird asked. Listen to the darkness. Will could feel it. Four years in the night's watch, and he had never been so afraid. What was it? Wind. Trees rustling. A wolf. Which sound is it that unmans you so, Gerd? When Gerd did not answer, Royce slid gracefully from his saddle. He tied the distria securely to a low hanging limb, well away from the other horses, and drew his long sword from its sheath. Jewels glittered in its hilt, and the moonlight ran down the shining steel. It was a splendid weapon, castle forged, and new made from the look of it. Will doubted it had ever been swung in anger. The trees press close here, Will warned. That sword will tangle you up, Lord. Better a knife. If I need instruction, I will ask for it, the young lord said. Gerd, stay here. Guard the horses. Gerd dismounted. We need a fire. I'll see to it. How big a fool are you, old man? If there are enemies in this wood, a fire is the last thing we want. There's some enemies a fire will keep away, Gerd said. Bears and direwolves and... Dot. And other things. Dot. Sir Waymer's mouth became a hard line. No fire. Gerd's hood shadowed his face, but Will could see the hard glitter in his eyes as he stared at the night. For a moment he was afraid the older man would go for his sword. It was a short, ugly thing, its grip discolored by sweat. Its edge nicked from hard use, but Will would not have given an iron bob for the lordling's life if Gerd pulled it from its scabbard. Finally Gerd looked down. No fire, he muttered, low under his breath. Royce took it for acquiescence and turned away. Lead on, he said to Will. Will threaded their way through a thicket, then started up the slope to the low ridge where he had found his vantage point under a sentinel tree. Under the thin crust of snow, the ground was damp and muddy, slick footing, with rocks and hidden roots to trip you up. Will made no sound as he climbed. Behind him, he heard the soft metallic slither of the lordling's ringmail, the rustle of leaves, and muttered curses as reaching branches grabbed at his long sword and tugged on his splendid sable cloak. The great sentinel was right there at the top of the ridge, 
where Will had known it would be, its lowest branches a bare foot off the ground. Will slid in underneath, flat on his belly in the snow and the mud, and looked down on the empty clearing below. His heart stopped in his chest. For a moment he dared not breathe. Moonlight shone down on the clearing, the ashes of the fire pit, the snow covered lean to, the great rock, the little half frozen stream. Everything was just as it had been a few hours ago. They were gone. All the bodies were gone. Gods. He heard behind him. A sword slashed at a branch as Sir Waymeroyce gained the ridge. He stood there beside the sentinel, long sword in hand, his cloak billowing behind him as the wind came up, outlined nobly against the stars for all to see. Get down! Will whispered urgently. Something's wrong. Royce did not move. He looked down at the empty clearing and laughed. Your dead men seem to have moved camp, Will. Will's voice abandoned him. He groped for words that did not come. It was not possible. His eyes swept back and forth over the abandoned campsite, stopped on the axe. A huge double-bladed battle axe, still lying where he had seen it last, untouched. A valuable weapon. Dot. On your feet, Will, Sir Waymer commanded. There's no one here. I won't have you hiding under a bush. Reluctantly, Will obeyed. Sir Waymer looked him over with open disapproval. I am not going back to Castle Black a failure on my first ranging. We will find these men. He glanced around. Up the tree. Be quick about it. Look for a fire. Will turned away, wordless. There was no use to argue. The wind was moving. It cut right through him. He went to the tree, a vaulting grey green sentinel, and began to climb. Soon his hands were sticky with sap, and he was lost among the needles. Fear filled his gut like a meal he could not digest. He whispered a prayer to the nameless gods of the wood, and slipped his dirk free of its sheath. He put it between his teeth to keep both hands free for climbing. The taste of cold iron in his mouth gave him comfort. Down below, the lordling called out suddenly, Who goes there? Will heard uncertainty in the challenge. He stopped climbing, he listened, he watched. The woods gave answer, the rustle of leaves, the icy rush of the stream, a distant hoot of a snow owl. The others made no sound. Will saw movement from the corner of his eye. Pale shapes gliding through the wood. He turned his head, glimpsed a white shadow in the darkness. Then it was gone. Branches stirred gently in the wind, scratching at one another with wooden fingers. Will opened his mouth to call down a warning, and the words seemed to freeze in his throat. Perhaps he was wrong. Perhaps it had only been a bird, a reflection on the snow, some trick of the moonlight. What had he seen, after all? Will, where are you? Sir Waymer called up. Can you see anything? He was turning in a slow circle, suddenly wary, his sword in hand. He must have felt them, as Will felt them. There was nothing to see. Answer me. Why is it so cold? It was cold. Shivering, Will clung more tightly to his perch. His face pressed hard against the trunk of the sentinel. He could feel the sweet, sticky sap on his cheek. A shadow emerged from the dark of the wood. It stood in front of Royce. Tall, it was, and gaunt and hard as old bones, with flesh pale as milk. Its armor seemed to change color as it moved, here it was white as new fallen snow, the black as shadow, everywhere dappled with the deep gray green of the trees. The patterns ran like moonlight on water with every step it took. Will heard the breath go out of Sir Wayne Royce in a long hiss. Come no farther, the lordling warned. His voice cracked like a boy's. He threw the long sable cloak back over his shoulders, to free his arms for battle, and took his sword in both hands. The wind had stopped. It was very cold. The other slid forward on silent feet. In its hand was a long sword like none that Will had ever seen. No human metal had gone into the forging of that blade. It was alive with moonlight, translucent, 
a shard of crystal so thin that it seemed almost to vanish when seen edge on. There was a faint blue shimmer to the thing, a ghost light that played around its edges, and somehow Will knew it was sharper than any razor. Sir Waymer met him bravely. Dance with me then. He lifted his sword high over his head, defiant. His hands trembled from the weight of it, or perhaps from the cold. Yet in that moment, Will thought, he was a boy no longer, but a man of the night's watch. The other halted. Will saw its eyes, blue, deeper and bluer than any human eyes, a blue that burned like ice. They fixed on the long sword trembling on high, watched the moonlight running cold along the metal. For a heartbeat he dared to hope. They emerged silently from the shadows, twins to the first. Three of them? Dot. Four. Dot. Five. Dot. Sir Waymer may have felt the cold that came with them, but he never saw them, never heard them. Will had to call out. It was his duty. And his death, if he did. He shivered, and hugged the tree, and kept the silence. The pale sword came shivering through the air. Sir Waymer met it with steel. When the blades met, there was no ring of metal on metal, only a high, thin sound at the edge of hearing, like an animal screaming in pain. Royce checked a second blow, and a third, then fell back a step. Another flurry of blows, and he fell back again. Behind him, to right, to left, all around him, the watchers stood patient faceless, silent, the shifting patterns of their delicate armor making them all but invisible in the wood. Yet they made no move to interfere. Again and again the swords met, until Will wanted to cover his ears against the strange anguished keening of their clash. Sir Waymer was panting from the effort now, his breath steaming in the moonlight. His blade was white with frost, the others danced with pale blue light, then Royce's parry came a beat too late. The pale sword bit through the ring mail beneath his arm. The young lord cried out in pain. Blood welled between the rings. It steamed in the cold, and the droplets seemed red as fire where they touched the snow. Sir Waymer's fingers brushed his side. His moleskin glove came away soaked with red. The other said something in a language that Will did not know. His voice was like the cracking of ice on a winter lake, and the words were mocking. Sir Waymer Royce found his fury. For Robert. He shouted, and he came up snarling, lifting the frost-covered longsword with both hands and swinging it around in a flat side arm slash with all his weight behind it. The other's parry was almost lazy. When the blades touched, the steel shattered. A scream echoed through the forest night and the long sword shivered into a hundred brittle pieces, the shards scattering like a rain of needles. Royce went to his knees, shrieking, and covered his eyes. Blood welled between his fingers. The watchers moved forward together, as if some signal had been given. Swords rose and fell, all in a deathly silence. It was cold butchery. The pale blades sliced through ring mail as if it were silk, Will closed his eyes. Far beneath him, he heard their voices and laughter sharp as icicles. When he found the courage to look again, a long time had passed, and the ridge below was empty. He stayed in the tree, scarce daring to breathe, while the moon crept slowly across the black sky. Finally, his muscles cramping and his fingers numb with cold, he climbed down. Royce's body lay face down in the snow one arm outflung. The thick sable cloak had been slashed in a dozen places. Lying dead like that, you saw how young he was. A boy. He found what was left of the sword a few feet away, the end splintered and twisted like a tree struck by lightning. Will knelt, looked around warily, and snatched it up. The broken sword would be his proof. Gerd would know what to make of it, and if not him, then surely that old bear Mormont or Master Emmon. Would Gerd still be waiting with the horses? He had to hurry. Will Rose? Sir Waymer Royce stood over him. His fine clothes were a tatter, his face a ruin. A shard from his sword transfixed the blind white pupil of his left eye. The right eye was open. The pupil burned blue. It saw. 
The broken sword fell from nerveless fingers. Will closed his eyes to pray. Long, elegant hands brushed his cheek, then tightened around his throat. They were gloved in the finest moleskin and sticky with blood, yet the touch was icy cold. Bran. The morning had dawned clear and cold, with a crispness that hinted at the end of summer. They set forth that daybreak to see a man beheaded, twenty in all, and Bran rode among them, nervous with excitement. This was the first time he had been deemed old enough to go with his lord father and his brothers to see the king's justice done. It was the ninth year of summer, and the seventh of Bran's life. The man had been taken outside a small hold fast in the hills. Rob thought he was a wildling, his sword sworn to Mansraider, the king beyond the wall. It made Bran's skin prickle to think of it. He remembered the hearth tales old Nan told them. The wildlings were cruel men, she said, slavers and slayers and thieves. They consorted with giants and ghouls, stole girl children in the dead of night, and drank blood from polished horns. And their women lay with the others in the long night to sigh a terrible half human children. But the man they found bound hand and foot to the hold fast wall awaiting the king's justice was old and scrawny, not much taller than Rob. He had lost both ears and a finger to frostbite, and he dressed tall in black, the same as a brother of the night's watch, except that his furs were ragged and greasy. The breath of man and horse mingled, steaming, in the cold morning air as his lord father had the man cut down from the wall and dragged before them. Rob and John sat tall and still on their horses, with Bran between them on his pony, trying to seem older than seven trying to pretend that he'd seen all this before. A faint wind blew through the hold fast gate. Over their heads flapped the banner of the Starks of Winterfell, a grey dire wall racing across an ice-white field. Bran's father sat solemnly on his horse, long brown hair stirring in the wind. His closely trimmed beard was shot with white, making him look older than his thirty-five years. He had a grim cast to his grey eyes this day and he seemed not at all the man who would sit before the fire in the evening and talk softly of the age of heroes and the children of the forest. He had taken off father's face, Bran thought, and donned the face of Lord Stark of Winterfell. There were questions asked and answers given there in the chill of morning, but afterward Bran could not recall much of what had been said. Finally his lord father gave a command and two of his guardsmen dragged the ragged man to the ironwood stump in the center of the square. They forced his head down onto the hard black wood. Lord Eddard Stark dismounted and his ward Theon Greyjoy brought forth the sword. Ice, that sword was called. It was as wide across as a man's hand, and taller even than Rob. The blade was Valyrian steel, spell-forged and dark as smoke. Nothing held an edge like Valyrian steel. His father peeled off his gloves and handed them to Jory Castle, the captain of his household guard. He took hold of ice with both hands and said, In the name of Robert of the House Baratheon, the first of his name, King of the Andals and the Roina and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm, by the word of Eddard of the House Stark, Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North, I do sentence you to die. He lifted the great sword high above his head. Bran's bastard brother Jon Snow moved closer. Keep the pony well in hand, he whispered. And don't look away. Father will know if you do. Bran kept his pony well in hand, and did not look away. His father took off the man's head with a single sure stroke. Blood sprayed out across the snow, as red as Cern wine. One of the horses reared and had to be restrained to keep from bolting. Bran could not take his eyes off the blood. The snows around this stump drank it eagerly, reddening as he watched. The head bounced off a thick root and rolled. It came up near Greyjoy's feet. Theon was a lean, dark youth of nineteen who found everything amusing. He laughed, put his boot on the head, and kicked it away. Ass, John muttered low enough so Greyjoy did not hear. He put a hand on Bran's shoulder, and Bran looked over at his bastard brother. You did well, John told him solemnly. John was fourteen, 
an old hand at justice. It seemed colder on the long ride back to Winterfell, though the wind had died by then and the sun was higher in the sky. Bran rode with his brothers, well ahead of the main party, his pony struggling hard to keep up with their horses. The deserter died bravely, Rob said. He was big and broad and growing every day, with his mother's coloring, the fair skin, red brown hair, and blue eyes of the Tullys of Riveron. He had courage, at the least. No, Jon Snow said quietly. It was not courage. This one was dead of fear. You could see it in his eyes, Stark. John's eyes were a grey so dark they seemed almost black, but there was little they did not see. He was of an age with Rob, but they did not look alike. John was slender where Rob was muscular, dark where Rob was fair, graceful and quick where his half-brother was strong and fast. Rob was not impressed. The others take his eyes, he swore. He died well. Race you to the bridge? Done, John said, kicking his horse forward. Rob cursed and followed, and they galloped off down the trail, Rob laughing and hooting, John silent and intent. The hooves of their horses kicked up showers of snow as they went. Bran did not try to follow. His pony could not keep up. He had seen the ragged man's eyes, and he was thinking of them now. After a while, the sound of Rob's laughter receded and the woods grew silent again. So deep in thought was he that he never heard the rest of the party until his father moved up to ride beside him. Are you well, Bran? He asked, not unkindly. Yes, father, Bran told him. He looked up. Wrapped in his furs and leathers, mounted on his great war horse, his lord father loomed over him like a giant. Rob says the man died bravely, but John says he was afraid. What do you think? His father asked. Bran thought about it. Can a man still be brave if he's afraid? That is the only time a man can be brave, his father told him. Do you understand why I did it? He was a wildling, Bran said. They carry off women and sell them to the others. His lord father smiled. Old Nan has been telling you stories again. In truth, the man was a no earthbreaker a deserter from the Night's Watch. No man is more dangerous. The deserter knows his life is forfeit if he is taken, so he will not flinch from any crime, no matter how vile. But you mistake me. The question was not why the man had to die, but why I must do it. Bran had no answer for that. King Robert has a headsman, he said, uncertainly. He does, his father admitted as did the Targaryen kings before him. Yet our way is the older way. The blood of the first men still flows in the veins of the Starks, and we hold to the belief that the man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. If you would take a man's life, you owe it to him to look into his eyes and hear his final words. And if you cannot bear to do that, then perhaps the man does not deserve to die. One day, Bran, you will be Rob's bannerman, holding a keep of your own for your brother and your king, and justice will fall to you. When that day comes, you must take no pleasure in the task, but neither must you look away. A ruler who hides behind paid executioners soon forgets what death is. That was when John reappeared on the crest of the hill before them. He waved and shouted down at them. Father, Bran, come quickly, see what Rob has found. Then he was gone again. Jory rode up beside them. Trouble, my lord. Beyond a doubt, his lord father said. Come, let us see what mischief my sons have routed out now. He sent his horse into a trot. Jory and Bran and the rest came after. They found Rob on the river bank north of the bridge, with John still mounted beside him. The late summer snows had been heavy this moon turn. Rob stood knee deep in white, his hood pulled back so the sun shone in his hair. He was cradling something in his arm, while the boys talked in hushed, excited voices. The riders picked their way carefully through the drifts, groping for solid footing on the hidden, uneven ground. Jory Castle and the on Greyjoy were the first to reach the boys. Greyjoy was laughing and joking as he rode. 
Bran heard the breath go out of him. Gods! he exclaimed, struggling to keep control of his horse as he reached for his sword. Jory's sword was already out. Rob, get away from it! he called as his horse reared under him. Rob grinned and looked up from the bundle in his arms. She can't hurt you, he said. She's dead, Jory. Bran was afire with curiosity by then. He would have spurred the pony faster, but his father made them dismount beside the bridge and approach on foot. Bran jumped off and ran. By then John, Jory, and Theon Greyjoy had all dismounted as well. What in the seven hells is it? Greyjoy was saying. A wolf, Rob told him. A freak, Greyjoy said. Look at the size of it. Bran's heart was thumping in his chest as he pushed through a waist-high drift to his brother's side. Half buried in blood-stained snow, a huge dark shape slumped in death. Ice had formed in its shaggy grey fur, and the faint smell of corruption clung to it like a woman's perfume. Bran glimpsed blind eyes crawling with maggots, a wide mouth full of yellowed teeth. But it was the size of it that made him gasp. It was bigger than his pony, twice the size of the largest hound in his father's kennel. It's no freak, John said calmly. That's a dire wolf. They grow larger than the other kind. Theon Greyjoy said, there's not been a dire wolf sighted south of the wall in two hundred years. I see one now. John replied. Bran tore his eyes away from the monster. That was when he noticed the bundle in Rob's arms. He gave a cry of delight and moved closer. The pup was a tiny ball of grey-black fur, its eyes still closed. It nuzzled blindly against Rob's chest as he cradled it, searching for milk among his leathers, making a sad little whimpery sound. Bran reached out hesitantly. Go on, Rob told him. You can touch him. Bran gave the pup a quick nervous stroke, then turned as John said, Here you go. His half brother put a second pup into his arms. There are five of them. Bran sat down in the snow and hugged the wolf pup to his face. Its fur was soft and warm against his cheek. Dire wolves loose in the realm, after so many years, muttered Hullen, the master of horse. I like it not. It is a sign, Jory said. Father frowned. This is only a dead animal, Jory, he said. Yet he seemed troubled. Snow crunched under his boots as he moved around the body. Do we know what killed her? There's something in the throat, Rob told him, proud to have found the answer before his father even asked. There, just under the jaw. His father knelt and groped under the beast's head with his hand. He gave a yank and held it up for all to see. A foot of shattered antler, tines snapped off, all wet with blood. A sudden silence descended over the party. The men looked at the antler uneasily, and no one dared to speak. Even Bran could sense their fear, though he did not understand. His father tossed the antler to the side and cleansed his hands in the snow. I'm surprised she lived long enough to whelp, he said. His voice broke the spell. Maybe she didn't, Jory said. I've heard tales. Dot. Maybe the bitch was already dead when the pups came. Born with the dead, another man put in. Worse luck. No matter, said Hullen. They be dead soon enough too. Bran gave a wordless cry of dismay. The sooner the better, Theon Greyjoy agreed. He drew his sword. Give the beast here, Bran. The little thing squirmed against him, as if it heard and understood. No! Bran cried out fiercely. It's mine. Put away your sword, Greyjoy, Rob said. For a moment he sounded as commanding as their father, like the lord he would someday be. We will keep these pups. You cannot do that, boy, said Harwin, who was Hullen's son. It be a mercy to kill them, Hullen said. Bran looked to his lord father for rescue, but got only a frown, a furrowed brow. Hullen speaks truly, son. Better a swift death than a hard one from cold and starvation. No. He could feel tears welling in his eyes, and he looked away. He did not want to cry in front of his father. 
Rob resisted stubbornly. Sir Audric's red bitch whelped again last week, he said. It was a small litter, only two live pups. She'll have milk enough. She'll rip them apart when they try to nurse. Lord Stark, John said. It was strange to hear him call father that, so formal. Bran looked at him with desperate hope. There are five pups, he told father. Three male, two female. What of it, John? You have five true-born children, John said. Three sons, two daughters. The dire wolf is the sigil of your house. Your children were meant to have these pups, my lord. Bran saw his father's face change, saw the other men exchange glances. He loved John with all his heart at that moment. Even at seven, Bran understood what his brother had done. The count had come right only because John had omitted himself. He had included the girls, included even Rickon, the baby, but not the bastard who bore the surname Snow. The name that custom decreed be given to all those in the north unlucky enough to be born with no name of their own. Their father understood as well. You want no pup for yourself, John? He asked softly. The dire wolf graces the banners of House Stark, John pointed out. I am no Stark, father. Their lord father regarded John thoughtfully. Rob rushed into the silence he left. I will nurse him myself, father he promised. I will soak a towel with warm milk, and give him suck from that. Me too. Bran echoed. The Lord weighed his sons long and carefully with his eyes. Easy to say, and harder to do. I will not have you wasting the servant's time with this. If you want these pups, you will feed them yourselves. Is that understood? Bran nodded eagerly. The pup squirmed in his grasp licked at his face with a warm tongue. You must train them as well, their father said. You must train them. The canal master will have nothing to do with these monsters, I promise you that. And the gods help you if you neglect them, or brutalize them, or train them badly. These are not dogs to beg for treats and slink off at a kick. A dire wolf will rip a man's arm off his shoulder as easily as a dog will kill a rat. Are you sure you want this? Yes, father, Bran said. Yes, Rob agreed. The pups may die anyway, despite all you do. They won't die, Rob said. We won't let them die. Keep them, then. Jory, Desmond, gather up the other pups. It's time we were back to Winterfell. It was not until they were mounted and on their way that Bran allowed himself to taste the sweet air of victory. By then, his pup was snuggled inside his leathers, warm against him, safe for the long ride home. Bran was wondering what to name him. Halfway across the bridge, John pulled up suddenly. What is it, John? Their lord father asked. Can't you hear it? Bran could hear the wind in the trees, the clatter of their hooves on the ironwood planks, the whimpering of his hungry pup, but John was listening to something else. There. John said. He swung his horse around and galloped back across the bridge. They watched him dismount where the dire wolf lay dead in the snow, watched him kneel. A moment later he was riding back to them, smiling. He must have crawled away from the others, John said. Or been driven away, their father said, looking at the sixth pup. His fur was white, where the rest of the litter was grey. His eyes were as red as the blood of the ragged man who had died that morning. Bran thought it curious that this pup alone would have opened his eyes while the others were still blind. An albino, Theon Greyjoy said with wry amusement. This one will die even faster than the others. Jon Snow gave his father's ward a long, chilling look. I think not, Greyjoy, he said. This one belongs to me. Catelyn. Catelyn had never liked this godswood. She had been born at Tully, at River Run far to the south, on the Red Fork of the Trident. The godswood there was a garden, bright and airy, where tall redwoods spread dappled shadows across tinkling streams, birds sang from hidden nests, and the air was spicy with the scent of flowers. The gods of Winterfell kept a different sort of wood. It was a dark, 
primal place, three acres of old forest untouched for ten thousand years as the gloomy castle rose around it. It smelled of moist earth and decay. No redwoods grew here. This was a wood of stubborn sentinel trees armored in gray green needles, of mighty oaks, of iron woods as old as the realm itself. Here thick black trunks crowded close together while twisted branches wove a dense canopy overhead and misshapen roots wrestled beneath the soil. This was a place of deep silence and brooding shadows, and the gods who lived here had no names. But she knew she would find her husband here tonight. Whenever he took a man's life, afterward he would seek the quiet of the god's wood. Catelyn had been anointed with the seven oils and named in the rainbow of light that filled the sept of river on. She was of the faith, like her father and grandfather and his father before him. Her gods had names, and their faces were as familiar as the faces of her parents. Worship was a septon with a censer, the smell of incense, a seven-sided crystal alive with light, voices raised in song. The Tullys kept a godswood, as all the great houses did but it was only a place to walk or read or lie in the sun. Worship was for the September. For her sake, Ned had built a small sept where she might sing to the seven faces of God, but the blood of the first men still flowed in the veins of the Starks, and his own gods were the old ones, the nameless, faceless gods of the green wood they shared with the vanished children of the forest. At the center of the grove an ancient weirwood brooded over a small pool where the waters were black and cold. The heart tree, Ned called it. The weirwood's bark was white as bone, its leaves dark red, like a thousand blood-stained hands. A face had been carved in the trunk of the great tree, its features long and melancholy, the deep-cut eyes red with dried sap and strangely watchful. They were old, those eyes, older than Winterfell itself. They had seen Brandon the Builder set the first stone, if the tales were true, they had watched the castle's granite walls rise around them. It was said that the children of the forest had carved the faces in the trees during the dawn centuries before the coming of the first men across the narrow sea. In the south the last weirwoods had been cut down or burned out a thousand years ago, except on the Isle of Faces where the green men kept their silent watch. Up here it was different. Here every castle had its godswood, and every godswood had its heart tree, and every heart tree its face. Catelyn found her husband beneath the weirwood, seated on a moss-covered stone. The great sword ice was across his lap, and he was cleaning the blade in those waters black as night. A thousand years of humor lay thick upon the godswood floor, swallowing the sound of her feet, but the red eyes of the weirwood seemed to follow her as she came. Ned she called softly. He lifted his head to look at her. Catelyn, he said. His voice was distant and formal. Where are the children? He would always ask her that. In the kitchen, arguing about names for the wolf pups. She spread her cloak on the forest floor and sat beside the pool, her back to the weirwood. She could feel the eyes watching her, but she did her best to ignore them. Aria is already in love and Sansu is charmed and gracious, but Rickon is not quite sure. Is he afraid? Ned asked. A little, she admitted. He is only three. Ned frowned. He must learn to face his fears. He will not be three forever. And winter is coming? Yes, Catelyn agreed. The words gave her a chill, as they always did. The stark words. Every noble house had its words. Family mottos, touchstones, prayers of sorts, they boasted of honor and glory, promised loyalty and truth, swore faith and courage. All but the Starks. Winter is coming, said the Stark words. Not for the first time, she reflected on what a strange people these northerners were. The man died well, I'll give him that, Nedda said. He had a swatch of oiled leather in one hand. He ran it lightly up the great sword as he spoke, polishing the metal to a dark glow. I was glad for Bran's sake. You would have been proud of Bran. I am always proud of Bran, Catelyn replied, watching the sword as he stroked it. She could see the rippling deep within the steel, 
where the metal had been folded back on itself a hundred times in the forging. Catelyn had no love for swords, but she could not deny that ice had its own beauty. It had been forged in Valeria, before the doom had come to the old freehold, when the ironsmiths had worked their metal with spells as well as hammers. Four hundred years old it was, and as sharp as the day it was forged. The name it bore was older still, a legacy from the Age of Heroes, when the Starks were kings in the north. He was the fourth this year, Nedda said grimly. The poor man was half mad. Something had put a fear in him so deep that my words could not reach him. He sighed. Ben writes that the strength of the Night's Watch is down below a thousand. It's not only desertions. They are losing men on rangings as well. Is it the wildlings? She asked. Who else? Ned lifted dice, looked down the cool steel length of it. And it will only grow worse. The day may come when I will have no choice but to call the banners and ride north to deal with this king beyond the wall for good and all. Beyond the wall? The thought made Catelyn shudder. Nedda saw the dread on her face. Man's raider is nothing for us to fear. There are darker things beyond the wall. She glanced behind her at the heart tree, the pale bark and red eyes, watching, listening, thinking its long slow thoughts. His smile was gentle. You listen to too many of old Nan's stories. The others are as dead as the children of the forest, gone eight thousand years. Master Lewin will tell you they never lived at all. No living man has ever seen one. Until this morning, no living man had ever seen a dire wolf either, Catelyn reminded him. I ought to know better than to argue with a Tully, he said with a rueful smile. He slid ice back into its sheath. You did not come here to tell me crib tales. I know how little you like this place. What is it, my lady? Catelyn took her husband's hand. There was grievous news today, my lord. I did not wish to trouble you until you had cleansed yourself. There was no way to soften the blow, so she told him straight. I am so sorry, my love. Jonarin is dead. His eyes found hers, and she could see how hard it took him, as she had known it would. In his youth, Ned had fostered at the Eyrie, and the childless Lordrin had become a second father to him and his fellow ward, Robert Baratheon. When the Mad King Aerys II Targaryen had demanded their heads, the Lord of the Eyrie had raised his moon and falcon banners in revolt rather than give up those he had pledged to protect. And one day fifteen years ago, this second father had become a brother as well, as he and Nedda stood together in the sceptred river unto wed two sisters, the daughters of Lord Hostetully. John. Dot. He said. Is this news certain? It was the king's seal, and the letter is in Robert's own hand. I saved it for you. He said Lord Arryn was taken quickly. Even Master Pysel was helpless, but he brought the milk of the poppy so John did not linger long in pain. That is some small mercy, I suppose, he said. She could see the grief on his face, but even then he thought first of her. Your sister, he said. And John's boy. What word of them? The message said only that they were well, and had returned to the Eyrie, Catelyn said. I wish they had gone to River Run instead. The Eyrie is high and lonely, and it was ever her husband's place not hers. Lord John's memory will haunt each stone. I know my sister. She needs the comfort of family and friends around her. Your uncle waits in the Vale, does he not? John named him Knight of the Gate, I'd heard. Catelyn nodded. Brynden will do what he can for her, and for the boy. That is some comfort, but still. Dot. Go to her, Ned urged. Take the children. Fill her halls with noise and shouts and laughter. That boy of hers needs other children about him, and Lizza should not be alone in her grief. Would that I could, Catelyn said. The letter had other tidings. The king is riding to Winterfell to seek you out. It took Ned a moment to comprehend her words, but when the understanding came, the darkness left his eyes. Robert is coming here? When she nodded, a smile broke across his face. Catelyn wished she could share his joy. 
But she had heard the talk in the yards, a dire wolf dead in the snow, a broken antler in its throat. Dread coiled within her like a snake, but she forced herself to smile at this man she loved, this man who put no faith in signs. I knew that would please you, she said. We should send word to your brother on the wall. Yes, of course, he agreed. Ben will want to be here. I shall tell Master Lewin to send his swiftest bird. Ned rose and pulled her to her feet. Damnation, how many years has it been? And he gives us no more notice than this? How many in his party? Did the message say? I should think a hundred knights, at the least, with all their retainers, and half again as many free riders. Sir Si and the children travel with them. Robert will keep an easy pace for their sakes, he said. It is just as well. That will give us more time to prepare. The Queen's brothers are also in the party, she told him. Ned grimaced at that. There was small love between him and the Queen's family, Catelyn knew. The Lannisters of Casterly Rock had come late to Robert's cause, when victory was all but certain, and he had never forgiven them. Well, if the price for Robert's company is an infestation of Lannisters, so be it. It sounds as though Robert is bringing half his court. Where the king goes, the realm follows, she said. It will be good to see the children. The youngest was still sucking at the Lannister woman's teeth the last time I saw him. He must be, what, five by now? Prince Tommen is seven, she told him. The same age as Bran. Please, Ned, guard your tongue. The Lannister woman is our queen, and her pride is said to grow with every passing year. Ned squeezed her hand. There must be a feast, of course, with singers, and Robert will want to hunt. I shall send Jory south with an honor guard to meet them on the king's road and escort them back. Gods, how are we going to feed them all? On his way already, you said. Damn the man. Damn his royal hide. Daenerys. Her brother held the gown up for her inspection. This is beauty. Touch it. Go on. Caress the fabric. Danny touched it. The cloth was so smooth that it seemed to run through her fingers like water. She could not remember ever wearing anything so soft. It frightened her. She pulled her hand away. Is it really mine? A gift from the Magister Illyrio, Viserys said, smiling. Her brother was in a high mood tonight. The color will bring out the violet in your eyes. And you shall have gold as well, and jewels of all sorts. Illyrio has promised. Tonight you must look like a princess. A princess, Danny thought. She had forgotten what that was like. Perhaps she had never really known. Why does he give us so much? She asked. What does he want from us? For nigh on half a year, they had lived in the Magister's house, eating his food, pampered by his servants. Danny was thirteen old enough to know that such gifts seldom come without their price, here in the free city of Pentos. Illyrio is no fool, Viserys said. He was a gaunt young man with nervous hands and a feverish look in his pale lilac eyes. The Magister knows that I will not forget my friends when I come into my throne. Danny said nothing. Magister Illyrio was a dealer in spices, gemstones, dragonbone, and other, less savory things. He had friends in all of the nine free cities, it was said, and even beyond, in Vzdothrak and the fabled lands beside the Jade Sea. It was also said that he'd never had a friend he wouldn't cheerfully sell for the right price. Danny listened to the talk in the streets, and she heard these things, but she knew better than to question her brother when he wove his webs of dream. His anger was a terrible thing when roused. Viserys called it waking the dragon. Her brother hung the gown beside the door. Illyrio will send the slaves to bathe you. Be sure you wash off the stink of the stables. Kaldrogo has a thousand horses, tonight he looks for a different sort of mount. He studied her critically. You still slouch. Straighten yourself he pushed back her shoulders with his hands. Let them see that you have a woman's shape now. His fingers brushed lightly over her budding breasts and tightened on a nipple. 
you will not fail me tonight. If you do, it will go hard for you. You don't want to wake the dragon, do you? His fingers twisted her, the pinch cruelly hard through the rough fabric of her tunic. Do you? He repeated. No, Danny said meekly. Her brother smiled. Good. He touched her hair, almost with affection. When they write the history of my reign, sweet sister, they will say that it began tonight. When he was gone, Danny went to her window and looked out wistfully on the waters of the bay. The square brick towers of Pentos were black silhouettes outlined against the setting sun. Danny could hear the singing of the red priests as they lit their night fires and the shouts of ragged children playing games beyond the walls of the estate. For a moment she wished she could be out there with them. Barefoot and breathless and dressed in tatters, with no past and no future and no feast to attend at Kldrogo's manse. Somewhere beyond the sunset, across the narrow sea, lay a land of green hills and flowered plains and great rushing rivers, where towers of dark stone rose amidst magnificent blue-gray mountains, and armored knights rode to battle beneath the banners of their lords. The Dothraki called that land Rashandali, the land of the Andals. In the free cities, they talked of Westeros and the Sunset Kingdoms. Her brother had a simpler name. Our land, he called it. The words were like a prayer with him. If he said them enough, the gods were sure to hear. Ours by blood right, taken from us by treachery, but ours still, ours forever. You do not steal from the dragon, oh, number. The dragon remembers. And perhaps the dragon did remember, but Danny could not. She had never seen this land her brother said was theirs, this realm beyond the narrow sea. These places he talked of, Castelly Rock and the Eyrie, High Garden and the Vale of Arin, Dawn and the Isle of Faces. They were just words to her. Visors had been a boy of eight when they fled King's Landing to escape the advancing armies of the usurper, but Daenerys had been only a quickening in their mother's womb. Yet sometimes Danny would picture the way it had been, so often had her brother told her the stories. The midnight flight to Dragonstone, moonlight shimmering on the ship's black sails. Her brother Ragger battling the usurper in the bloody waters of the Trident and dying for the woman he loved. The sack of King's Landing by the one's visor is called the Usurper's Dogs. The Lords Lannister and Stark. Princess Elia of Dawn pleading for mercy as Ragga's heir was ripped from her breast and murdered before her eyes. The polished skulls of the last dragons staring down sightlessly from the walls of the throne room while the King's Lair opened father's throat with a golden sword. She had been born on Dragonstone nine moons after their flight while a raging summer storm threatened to rip the island fastness apart. They said that storm was terrible. The Targaryen fleet was smashed while it lay at anchor, and huge stone blocks were ripped from the parapets and sent hurtling into the wild waters of the narrow sea. Her mother had died birthing her, and for that her brother Visors had never forgiven her. She did not remember Dragonstone either. They had run again, just before the usurper's brother set sail with his new built fleet. By then only Dragonstone itself, the ancient seat of their house, had remained of the seven kingdoms that had once been theirs. It would not remain for long. The garrison had been prepared to sell them to the usurper, but one night Sir Willem Darry and four loyal men had broken into the nursery and stolen them both, along with her wet nurse and set sail under cover of darkness for the safety of the brave Ozean coast. She remembered Sir Willem dimly, a great grey bear of man, half blind, roaring and bellowing orders from his sickbed. The servants had lived in terror of him, but he had always been kind to Danny. He called her little princess and sometimes my lady, and his hands were soft as old leather. He never left his bed, though, and the smell of sickness clung to him day and night, a hot, moist, sickly sweet odor. That was when they lived in Bravos, in the big house with the red door. Danny had her own room there, with a lemon tree outside her window. After Sir Willem had died, the servants had stolen what little money they had left, and soon after they had been put out of the big house. Danny had cried when the red door closed behind them forever. They had wandered since then, 
from Bravos to Mir, from Mir to Tyrosh, and on to Koher and Volantis and Liz, never staying long in any one place. Her brother would not allow it. The usurper's hired knives were close behind them, he insisted, though Danny had never seen one. At first the magisters and archons and merchant princes were pleased to welcome the last Targaryens to their homes and tables, but as the years passed and the usurper continued to sit upon the Iron Throne, doors closed and their lives grew meaner. Years past they had been forced to sell their last few treasures, and now even the coin they had gotten from Mother's Crown had gone. In the alleys and wine sinks of Pentos, they called her brother the Beggar King. Danny did not want to know what they called her. We will have it all back some day, sweet sister, he would promise her. Sometimes his hands shook when he talked about it. The jewels and the silks, Dragonstone and King's Landing, the Iron Throne and the Seven Kingdoms, all they have taken from us, we will have it back. Viserys lived for that day. All that Daenerys wanted back was the big house with the red door the lemon tree outside her window, the childhood she had never known. There came a soft knock on her door. Come, Danny said, turning away from the window. Illyrio's servants entered, bowed, and set about their business. They were slaves, a gift from one of the Magister's many Dothraki friends. There was no slavery in the free city of Pentos. Nonetheless, they were slaves. The old woman, small and grey as a mouse, never said a word, but the girl made up for it. She was Illyrio's favorite, a fair horde, blue-eyed wench of sixteen who chattered constantly as she worked. They filled her bath with hot water brought up from the kitchen and scented it with fragrant oils. The girl pulled the rough cotton tunic over Danny's head and helped her into the tub. The water was scalding hot, but Denaris did not flinch or cry out. She liked the heat. It made her feel clean. Besides, her brother had often told her that it was never too hot for a Targaryen. Ours is the house of the dragon, he would say. The fire is in our blood. The old woman washed her long, silver pale hair and gently combed out the snags, all in silence. The girl scrubbed her back and her feet and told her how lucky she was. Drogo is so rich that even his slaves wear golden collars. A hundred thousand men ride in his Kalesar, and his palace in Vzdothrak has two hundred rooms and doors of solid silver. There was more like that, so much more. What a handsome man Nickel was, so tall and fierce, fearless in battle, the best rider ever to mount a horse, a demon archer. Daenerys said nothing. She had always assumed that she would wed Viserys when she came of age. For centuries the Targaryens had married brother to sister, since Aegon the Conqueror had taken his sisters to bride. The line must be kept pure, Viserys had told her a thousand times. Theirs was the king's blood. The golden blood of old Valyria, the blood of the dragon. Dragons did not mate with the beasts of the field, and Targaryens did not mingle their blood with that of lesser men. Yet now Viserys schemed to sell her to a stranger, a barbarian. When she was clean, the slaves helped her from the water and toweled her dry. The girl brushed her hair until it shone like molten silver, while the old woman anointed her with the spice flower perfume of the Dothraki plains, a dab on each wrist, behind her ears, on the tips of her breasts, and one last one, cool on her lips, down there between her legs. They dressed her in the wisps that Magister Illyrio had sent up and then the gown, a deep plum silk to bring out the violet in her eyes. The girl slid the gilded sandals onto her feet, while the old woman fixed the tiara in her hair, and slid golden bracelets crusted with amethysts around her wrists. Last of all came the collar, a heavy golden torque emblazoned with ancient Valerian glyphs. Now you look all a princess, the girl said breathlessly when they were done. Danny glanced at her image in the silvered looking glass that Illyrio had so thoughtfully provided. A princess, she thought, but she remembered what the girl had said, how Kaldrogo was so rich even his slaves wore golden collars. She felt a sudden chill, and goose flesh pimpled her bare arms. Her brother was waiting in the cool of the entry hall, 
seated on the edge of the pool, his hand trailing in the water. He rose when she appeared and looked her over critically. Stand there, he told her. Turn around. Yes. Good. You look. Dot. Regal, Magister Illyrio said, stepping through an archway. He moved with surprising delicacy for such a massive man. Beneath loose garments of flame-colored silk, rolls of fat jiggled as he walked. Gemstones glittered on every finger, and his man had oiled his forked yellow beard until it shone like real gold. May the Lord of Light shower you with blessings on this most fortunate day, Princess Dinaris, the Magister said as he took her hand. He bowed his head, showing a thin glimpse of crooked yellow teeth through the gold of his beard. She is a vision, your grace, a vision, he told her brother. Drogo will be enraptured. She's too skinny, Viserys said. His hair, the same silver blonde as hers, had been pulled back tightly behind his head and fastened with a dragon bone brooch. It was a severe look that emphasized the hard, gaunt lines of his face. He rested his hand on the hilt of the sword that Illyrio had lent him, and said, Are you sure that Kaldrogo likes his women this young? She has had her blood. She is old enough for the Kl, Illyrio told him, not for the first time. Look at her. That silver gold hair, those purple eyes. Dot. She is the blood of old Valeria, no doubt, no doubt. Dot. And highborn, daughter of the old king, sister to the new, she cannot fail to entrance our Drogo. When he released her hand, Daenerys found herself trembling. I suppose, her brother said doubtfully. The savages have queer tastes. Boys, horses, sheep. Dot. Best not suggest this to Kaldrogo, Illyrio said. Anger flashed in her brother's lilac eyes. Do you take me for a fool? The magister bowed slightly. I take you for a king? Kings lack the caution of common men. My apologies if I had given offence. He turned away and clapped his hands for his bearers. The streets of Pentos were pitch dark when they set out in Illyrio's elaborately carved palanquin. Two servants went ahead to light their way, carrying ornate oil lanterns with panes of pale blue glass, while a dozen strong men hoisted the poles to their shoulders. It was warm and close inside behind the curtains. Danny could smell the stench of Illyrio's pallid flesh through his heavy perfumes. Her brother, sprawled out on his pillows beside her, never noticed. His mind was away across the narrow sea. We won't need his whole Kalazar, Viserys said. His fingers toyed with the hilt of his borrowed blade, though Danny knew he had never used a sword in earnest. Ten thousand, that would be enough, I could sweep the seven kingdoms with ten thousand Dothraki screamers. The realm will rise for its rightful king. Tyrell, Redwine, Darry, Greyjoy, they have no more love for the usurper than I do. The Dornishmen burn to Evangelia and her children. And the small folk will be with us. They cry out for their king. He looked at Illyrio anxiously. They do, don't they? They are your people, and they love you well, Magister Illyrio said amiably. In holdfasts all across the realm. Men lift secret toasts to your health while women sew dragon banners and hide them against the day of your return from across the water. He gave a massive shrug. Or so my agents tell me. Danny had no agents, no way of knowing what anyone was doing or thinking across the narrow sea, but she mistrusted Illyrio's sweet words as she mistrusted everything about Illyrio. Her brother was nodding eagerly, however. I shall kill the usurper myself he promised, who had never killed anyone, as he killed my brother Aga. And Lannister too, the king's lair, for what he did to my father. That would be most fitting, Magister Illyrio said. Danny saw the smallest hint of a smile playing around his full lips, but her brother did not notice. Nodding, he pushed back a curtain and stared off into the night, and Danny knew he was fighting the Battle of the Trident once again. The nine-towered manse of Kaldrogo sat beside the waters of the bay, its high brick walls overgrown with pale ivy. It had been given to the Kl by the Magisters of Pentos, Illyrio told them. 
the free cities were always generous with the horse lords. It is not that we fear these barbarians, Illyrio would explain with a smile. The Lord of Light would hold our city walls against a million Dothraki, or so the Red Priests promise. Dot. Yet why take chances, when their friendship comes so cheap? Their palanquin was stopped at the gate, the curtains pulled roughly back by one of the house guards. He had the copper skin and dark arm and eyes of a Dothraki, but his face was hairless and he wore the spiked bronze cap of the unsullied. He looked them over coldly. Magister Illyrio growled something to him in the rough Dothraki tongue. The guardsmen replied in the same voice and waved them through the gates. Danny noticed that her brother's hand was clenched tightly around the hilt of his borrowed sword. He looked almost as frightened as she felt. Insolent eunuch, Viserys muttered as the palanquin lurched up toward the manse. Magister Illyrio's words were honey. Many important men will be at the feast tonight. Such men have enemies. The Kl must protect his guests, yourself chief among them, your grace. No doubt the usurper would pay well for your head. Oh, yes, Viserys said darkly. He has tried, Illyrio, I promise you that. His hired knives followers everywhere. I am the last dragon, and he will not sleep easy while I live. The palanquin slowed and stopped. The curtains were thrown back, and a slave offered a hand to help Daenerys out. His collar, she noted, was ordinary bronze. Her brother followed, one hand still clenched hard around his sword hilt. It took two strong men to get Magister Illyrio back on his feet. Inside the manse, the air was heavy with the scent of spices, pinch fire and sweet lemon and cinnamon. They were escorted across the entry hall, where a mosaic of colored glass depicted the doom of Valyria. Oil burned in black iron lanterns all along the walls. Beneath an arch of twining stone leaves, a eunuch sang their coming. Viserys of the house Targaryen, the third of his name, he called in a high, sweet voice, King of the Andals and the Roina and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm. His sister, Daenerys Stormborn, Princess of Dragonstone. His honorable host, Illyrio Mopatis, Magister of the Free City of Pentos. They stepped past the eunuch into a pillared courtyard overgrown in pale ivy. Moonlight painted the leaves in shades of bone and silver as the guests drifted among them. Many were Dothraki horse lords, big men with red brown skin, their drooping mustachios bound in metal rings, their black hair oiled and braided and hung with bells. Yet among them moved bravos and sellswords from Pentos and Myr and Tyrosh a red priest even fatter than Illyrio, hairy men from the port of Ebon, and lords from the Summer Isles with skin as black as ebony. Daenerys looked at them all in wonder. Dot. And realized, with a sudden start of fear, that she was the only woman there. Illyrio whispered to them. Those three are Drogo's blood riders, there, he said. By the pillar is Kilmara, with his son Rogera. The man with the green beard is brother to the Archon of Tyrosh, and the man behind him is Sir Jerome Mormont. The last name caught Diener is. A knight? No less. Illyrio smiled through his beard. Anointed with the seven oils by the High Septon himself. What is he doing here? She blurted. The usurper wanted his head, Illyrio told them. Some trifling affront. He sold some poachers to a Tyrosi slaver instead of giving them to the Night's Watch. Absurd law. A man should be able to do as he likes with his own chattel. I shall wish to speak with Sergera before the night is done, her brother said. Danny found herself looking at the knight curiously. He was an older man, past forty and balding, but still strong and fit. Instead of silks and cottons, he wore wool and leather. His tunic was a dark green, embroidered with the likeness of a black bear standing on two legs. She was still looking at this strange man from the homeland she had never known when Magister Illyrio placed a moist hand on her bare shoulder. Over there, sweet princess, he whispered, there is the Kl himself. Danny wanted to run and hide, 
but her brother was looking at her, and if she displeased him she knew she would wake the dragon. Anxiously, she turned and looked at the man Visor's hoped would ask to wed her before the night was done. The slave girl had not been far wrong, she thought. Kaldrogo was a head taller than the tallest man in the room, yet somehow light on his feet, as graceful as the panther in Illyrio's menagerie. He was younger than she'd thought, no more than thirty. His skin was the color of polished copper, his thick mustachios bound with gold and bronze rings. I must go and make my submissions, Magister Illyrio said. Wait here. I shall bring him to you. Her brother took her by the arm as Illyrio waddled over to the cl, his fingers squeezing so hard that they hurt. Do you see his braid, sweet sister? Drogo's braid was black as midnight and heavy with scented oil, hung with tiny bells that rang softly as he moved. It swung well past his belt, below even his buttocks, the end of it brushing against the back of his thighs. You see how long it is? Visories said. When Dothraki are defeated in combat, they cut off their braids in disgrace, so the world will know their shame. Kaldrogo has never lost a fight. He is Egan the Dragon Lord come again, and you will be his queen? Danny looked at Kaldrogo. His face was hard and cruel, his eyes as cold and dark as onyx. Her brother hurt her sometimes, when she woke the dragon, but he did not frighten her the way this man frightened her. I don't want to be his queen, she heard herself say in a small, thin voice. Please, please, Visories, I don't want to, I want to go home. Home? He kept his voice low, but she could hear the fury in his tone. How are we to go home, sweet sister? They took our home from us. He drew her into the shadows, out of sight, his fingers digging into her skin. How are we to go home? He repeated, meaning King's Landing, and Dragonstone, and all the realm they had lost. Danny had only meant their rooms in Illyrio's estate, no true home surely, though all they had, but her brother did not want to hear that. There was no home there for him. Even the big house with the red door had not been home for him. His fingers dug hard into her arm, demanding an answer. I don't know. Dot. She said at last her voice breaking. Tears welled in her eyes. I do, he said sharply. We go home with an army, sweet sister. With Kaldrogo's army, that is how we go home. And if you must wed him and bed him for that, you will. He smiled at her. I'd let his whole Kaleza fuck you if need be, sweet sister, all forty thousand men, and their horses too if that was what it took to get my army. Be grateful it is only Drogo. In time you may even learn to like him. Now dry your eyes. Illyrio is bringing him over, and he will not see you crying. Danny turned and saw that it was true. Magister Illyrio, all smiles and bows, was escorting Kaldrogo over to where they stood. She brushed away unfallen tears with the back of her hand. Smile, Visories whispered nervously his hand failing to the hilt of his sword. And stand up straight. Let him see that you have breasts. Gods know, you have little enough as is. Dinaris smiled, and stood up straight. Ended. The visitors poured through the castle gates in a river of gold and silver and polished steel, three hundred strong, a pride of bannermen and knights, of sworn swords and free riders. Over their heads a dozen golden banners whipped back and forth in the northern wind, emblazoned with the crowned stag of Baratheon. Ned knew many of the riders. There came Sir Jaime Lannister with hair as bright as beaten gold, and there Sander Clegane with his terrible burned face. The tall boy beside him could only be the crown prince, and that stunted little man behind them was surely the imp, Dirian Lannister. Yet the huge man at the head of the column, flanked by two knights in the snow-white cloaks of the king's guard, seemed almost a stranger to Ned. Dot. Until he vaulted off the back of his warhorse with a familiar roar, and crushed him in a bone-crunching hug. Ned. Ah, but it is good to see that frozen face of yours. The king looked him over top to bottom, and laughed. 
you have not changed at all. Would that Ned had been able to say the same. Fifteen years passed, when they had ridden forth to win a throne, the Lord of Storm's End had been clean shaven, clear eyed, and muscled like a maiden's fantasy. Six and a half feet tall, he towered over lesser men, and when he donned his armor and the great antlered helmet of his house, he became a veritable giant. He'd had a giant's strength too, his weapon of choice a spiked iron war armor that Ned could scarcely lift. In those days, the smell of leather and blood had clung to him like perfume. Now it was perfume that clung to him like perfume, and he had a girth to match his height. Ned had last seen the king nine years before during Barlon Greyjoy's rebellion when the stag and the direwolf had joined to end the pretensions of the self-proclaimed king of the Iron Islands. Since the night they had stood side by side in Greyjoy's fallen stronghold, where Robert had accepted the rebel lord's surrender and Ned had taken his son Theon as hostage and ward, the king had gained at least eight stone. A beard as coarse and black as iron wire covered his jaw to hide his double chin and the sag of the royal jowls but nothing could hide his stomach or the dark circles under his eyes. Yet Robert was Ned's king now, and not just a friend, so he said only, Your Grace. Winterfell is yours. By then the others were dismounting as well, and grooms were coming forward for their mounts. Robert's queen, Cersei Lannister, entered on foot with her younger children. The wheelhouse in which they had ridden, a huge double-decked carriage of oiled oak and gilded metal pulled by forty heavy draught horses, was too wide to pass through the castle gate. Ned knelt in the snow to kiss the queen's ring, while Robert embraced Catelyn like a long-lost sister. Then the children had been brought forward, introduced, and approved of by both sides. No sooner had those formalities of greeting been completed than the king had said to his host, Take me down to your crypt, Edward. I would pay my respects. Ned loved him for that, for remembering her still after all these years. He called for a lantern. No other words were needed. The queen had begun to protest. They had been riding since dawn, everyone was tired and cold, surely they should refresh themselves first. The dead would wait. She had said no more than that, Robert had looked at her, and her twin brother Jaime had taken her quietly by the arm and she had said no more. They went down to the crypt together, Ned and this king he scarcely recognized. The winding stone steps were narrow. Ned went first with the lantern. I was starting to think we would never reach Winterfell, Robert complained as they descended. In the south, the way they talk about my seven kingdoms, a man forgets that your part is as big as the other six combined. I trust you enjoyed the journey, your grace. Robert snorted. Bogs and forests and fields, and scarcely a decent inn north of the neck. I've never seen such a vast emptiness. Where are all your people? Likely they were too shy to come out, Ned jested. He could feel the chill coming up the stairs, a cold breath from deep within the earth. Kings are a rare sight in the north. Robert snorted. More likely they were hiding under the snow. Snow, Ned. The king put one hand on the wall to steady himself as they descended. Late summer snows are common enough, Nedda said. I hope they did not trouble you. They are usually mild. The others take your mild snows, Robert swore. What will this place be like in winter? I shudder to think. The winters are hard, Ned admitted. But the Starks will endure. We always have. You need to come south, Robert told him. You need a taste of summer before it flees. In High Garden there are fields of gold and roses that stretch away as far as the eye can see. The fruits are so ripe they explode in your mouth, melons, beeches, fireplums, you've never tasted such sweetness. You'll see, I brought you some. Even at storm's end, with that good wind off the bay, the days are so hot you can barely move. And you ought to see the towns, Ned. Flowers everywhere the markets bursting with food, the summer wines so cheap and so good that you can get drunk just breathing the air. Everyone is fat and drunk and rich. He laughed and slapped his own ample stomach a thump. And the girls, Ned. 
he exclaimed, his eyes sparkling. I swear, women lose all modesty in the heat. They swim naked in the river, right beneath the castle. Even in the streets, it's too damn hot for wool or fur, so they go around in these short gowns, silk if they have the silver and cotton if not, but it's all the same when they start sweating and the cloth sticks to their skin, they might as well be naked. The king laughed happily. Robert Baratheon had always been a man of huge appetites, a man who knew how to take his pleasures. That was not a charge anyone could lay at the door of Eddard's dark. Yet Ned could not help but notice that those pleasures were taking a toll on the king. Robert was breathing heavily by the time they reached the bottom of the stairs, his face red in the lantern light as they stepped out into the darkness of the crypt. Your Grace, Ned said respectfully. He swept the lantern in a wide semicircle. Shadows moved and lurched. Flickering light touched the stones underfoot and brushed against a long procession of granite pillars that marched ahead, two by two, into the dark. Between the pillars, the dead sat on their stone thrones against the walls, backs against the sepulchres that contained their mortal remains. She is down at the end, with Father and Brandon. He led the way between the pillars and Robert followed wordlessly, shivering in the subterranean chill. It was always cold down here. Their footsteps rang off the stones and echoed in the vault overhead as they walked among the dead of House Stark. The Lords of Winterfell watched them pass. Their likenesses were carved into the stones that seal the tombs. In long rows they sat, blind eyes staring out into eternal darkness while great stone dire wolves curled round their feet. The shifting shadows made the stone figures seem to stir as the living passed by. By ancient custom an iron long sword had been laid across the lap of each who had been Lord of Winterfell, to keep the vengeful spirits in their crypts. The oldest had long ago rusted away to nothing, leaving only a few red stains where the metal had rested on stone. Ned wondered if that meant those ghosts were free to roam the castle now. He hoped not. The first lords of Winterfell had been men hard as the land they ruled. In the centuries before the dragon lords came over the sea, they had sworn allegiance to no man, styling themselves the kings in the north. Ned stopped at last and lifted the oil lantern. The crypt continued on into darkness ahead of them, but beyond this point the tombs were empty and unsealed, black holes waiting for their dead, waiting for him and his children. Ned did not like to think on that. Here, he told his king. Robert nodded silently, knelt, and bowed his head. There were three tombs, side by side. Lord Ricard Stark, Ned's father, had a long, stern face. The stonemason had known him well. He sat with quiet dignity, stone fingers holding tight to the sword across his lap, but in life all swords had failed him. In two smaller sepulchres on either side were his children. Brandon had been twenty when he died, strangled by order of the Mad King Ares Targaryen only a few short days before he was to wed Catelyn Tully of Riveron. His father had been forced to watch him die. He was the true heir, the eldest, born to rule. Lyanna had only been sixteen, a child woman of surpassing loveliness. Ned had loved her with all his heart. Robert had loved her even more. She was to have been his bride. She was more beautiful than that, the king said after a silence. His eyes lingered on Lyanna's face, as if he could will her back to life. Finally he rose, made awkward by his weight. Ah, damn it, Ned! Did you have to bury her in a place like this? His voice was hoarse with remembered grief. She deserved more than darkness. Dot. She was a Stark of Winterfell, Nedda said quietly. This is her place. She should be on a hill somewhere, under a fruit tree, with the sun and clouds above her and the rain to wash her clean. I was with her when she died, Ned reminded the king. She wanted to come home to rest beside Brandon and father. He could hear her still at times. Promise me, she had cried, in a room that smelled of blood and roses. Promise me, Ned. The fever had taken her strength and her voice had been faint as a whisper, 
but when he gave her his word, the fear had gone out of his sister's eyes. Ned remembered the way she had smiled then, how tightly her fingers had clutched his as she gave up her hold on life, the rose petals spilling from her palm, dead and black. After that he remembered nothing. They had found him still holding her body, silent with grief. The little Krenigman, Howland Reed, had taken her hand from his. Ned could recall none of it. I bring her flowers when I can, he said. Lyanna was. Dot. Fond of flowers. The king touched her cheek, his fingers brushing across the rough stone as gently as if it were living flesh. I vowed to kill Ragor for what he did to her. You did, Ned reminded him. Only once, Robert said bitterly. They had come together at the ford of the trident while the battle crashed around them, Robert with his war armor and his great antlered helm, the Targaryen prince armored all in black. On his breastplate was the three-headed dragon of his house, wrought all in rubies that flashed like fire in the sunlight. The waters of the trident ran red around the hooves of their destriers as they circled and clashed, again and again until at last a crushing blow from Robert's hammer stove in the dragon and the chest beneath it. When Ned had finally come on the scene, Ragger lay dead in the stream, while men of both armies scrabbled in the swirling waters for rubies knocked free of his armor. In my dreams, I kill him every night, Robert admitted. A thousand deaths will still be less than he deserves. There was nothing Ned could say to that. After a quiet, he said, we should return. Your grace. Your wife will be waiting. The others take my wife, Robert muttered sourly, but he started back the way they had come, his footsteps falling heavily. And if I hear your grace once more, I'll have your head on a spike. We are more to each other than that. I had not forgotten, Ned replied quietly. When the king did not answer, he said, Tell me about John. Robert shook his head. I have never seen a man sicken so quickly. We gave a tourney on my son's name day. If you had seen John then, you would have sworn he would live forever. A fortnight later he was dead. The sickness was like a fire in his gut. It burned right through him. He paused beside a pillar, before the tomb of a long dead Stark. I loved that old man. We both did. Ned paused a moment. Catelyn fears for her sister. How does Lisa bear her grief? Robert's mouth gave a bitter twist. Not well, in truth, he admitted. I think losing John has driven the woman mad, Ned. She has taken the boy back to the Eyrie. Against my wishes. I had hoped to foster him with Tywin Lannister at Casterly Rock. John had no brothers, no other sons. Was I supposed to leave him to be raised by women? Ned would sooner entrust a child to a pit viper than to Lord Tywin, but he left his doubts unspoken. Some old wounds never truly heal, and bleed again at the slightest word. The wife has lost the husband, he said carefully. Perhaps the mother feared to lose the son. The boy is very young. Six, and sickly, and Lord of the Eyrie. Gods have mercy, the king swore. Lord Tywin had never taken a ward before. Lizzo ought to have been honored. The Lannisters are a great and noble house. She refused to even hear of it. Then she left in the dead of night, without so much as a by your leave. Cersei was furious. He sighed deeply. The boy is my namesake, did you know that? Robert Arryn. I am sworn to protect him. How can I do that if his mother steals him away? I will take him as ward, if you wish, Nedda said. Lizza should consent to that. She and Catelyn were close as girls, and she would be welcome here as well. A generous offer, my friend, the king said, but too late. Lord Tywin has already given his consent. Fostering the boy elsewhere would be a grievous affront to him. I have more concern for my nephew's welfare than I do for Lannister pride, Ned declared. That is because you do not sleep with a Lannister. Robert laughed the sound rattling among the tombs and bouncing from the vaulted ceiling. His smile was a flash of white teeth in the thicket of the huge black beard. Ah, Ned, he said, you are still too serious. 
he put a massive arm around Ned's shoulders. I had planned to wait a few days to speak to you, but I see now there's no need for it. Come, walk with me. They started back down between the pillars. Blind stone eyes seemed to follow them as they passed. The king kept his arm around Ned's shoulder. You must have wondered why I finally came north to Winterfell, after so long. Ned had his suspicions, but he did not give them voice. For the joy of my company, surely, he said lightly. And there is the wall. You need to see it, your grace, to walk along its battlements and talk to those who man it. The Night's Watch is a shadow of what it once was. Benjamin says, no doubt I will hear what your brother says soon enough, Robert said. The wall has stood for what, eight thousand years? It can keep a few days more. I have more pressing concerns. These are difficult times. I need good men about me. Men like John Irwin. He served as Lord of the Eyrie, as Warden of the East, as the Hand of the King. He will not be easy to replace. His son. Dot. Ned began. His son will succeed to the Eyrie and all its incomes. Robert said brusquely. No more. That took Ned by surprise. He stopped, startled, and turned to look at his king. The words came unbidden. The Irins have always been wardens of the East. The title goes with the domain. Perhaps when he comes of age, the honor can be restored to him, Robert said. I have this year to think of, and next. A six year old boy is no war leader, Ned. In peace, the title is only in honor. Let the boy keep it. For his father's sake if not his own. Surely you owe John that much for his service. The king was not pleased. He took his arm from around Ned's shoulders. John's service was the duty he owed his liege lord. I am not ungrateful, Ned. You of all men ought to know that. But the son is not the father. A mere boy cannot hold the east. Then his tone softened. Enough of this. There is a more important office to discuss, and I would not argue with you. Robert grasped Ned by the elbow. I have need of you, Ned. I am yours to command, your grace. Always. They were words he had to say, and so he said them, apprehensive about what might come next. Robert scarcely seemed to hear him. Those years we spent in the Eyrie. Dot. Gods, those were good years. I want you at my side again, Ned. I want you down in King's Landing, not up here at the end of the world where you are no damned use to anybody. Robert looked off into the darkness, for a moment as melancholy as a stark. I swear to you, sitting a throne is a thousand times harder than winning one. Laws are a tedious business and counting coppers is worse. And the people. Dot. There is no end of them. I sit on that damnable iron chair and listen to them complain until my mind is numb and my ass is raw. They all want something, money or land or justice. The lies they tell. Dot. And my lords and ladies are no better. I am surrounded by flatterers and fools. It can drive a man to madness, Ned. Half of them don't dare tell me the truth, and the other half can't find it. There are nights I wish we had lost at the Trident. Ah, no, not truly, but... Dot. I understand, Nedda said softly. Robert looked at him. I think you do. If so, you are the only one, my old friend. He smiled. Lord Eddard Stark, I would name you the Hand of the King? Ned dropped to one knee. The offer did not surprise him. What other reason could Robert have had for coming so far? The Hand of the King was the second most powerful man in the Seven Kingdoms. He spoke with the King's voice, commanded the King's armies, drafted the King's laws. At times he even sat upon the Iron Throne to dispense King's justice, when the King was absent, or sick, or otherwise indisposed. Robert was offering him a responsibility as large as the realm itself. It was the last thing in the world he wanted. Your grace, he said. I am not worthy of the honor. Robert groaned with good-humored impatience. If I wanted to honor you, I'd let you retire. 
I am planning to make you run the kingdom and fight the wars while I eat and drink and wench myself into an early grave. He slapped his gut and grinned. You know the saying, about the king and his hand? Ned knew the saying. What the king dreams, he said. The hand builds. I bedded a fish maid once who told me the lowborn have a choice a way to put it. The king eats, they say, and the hand takes the shit. He threw back his head and roared his laughter. The echoes rang through the darkness, and all around them the dead of winter fell seemed to watch with cold and disapproving eyes. Finally the laughter dwindled and stopped. Ned was still on one knee, his eyes upraised. Damn it, Ned, the king complained. You might at least humor me with a smile. They say it grows so cold up here in winter that a man's laughter freezes in his throat and chokes him to death, Ned said evenly. Perhaps that is why the Starks have so little humor. Come south with me, and I'll teach you how to laugh again, the king promised. You helped me win this damnable throne, now help me hold it. We were meant to rule together. If Lyanna had lived, we should have been brothers, bound by blood as well as affection. Well, it is not too late. I have a son. You have a daughter. My Joff and your Sansa shall join our houses, as Lyanna and I might once have done. This offer did surprise him. Sansa is only eleven. Robert waved an impatient hand. Old enough for betrothal. The marriage can wait a few years. The king smiled. Now stand up and say yes, curse you. Nothing would give me greater pleasure, your grace. Ned answered. He hesitated. These honors are all so unexpected. May I have some time to consider? I need to tell my wife. Dot. Yes, yes, of course, tell Catelyn, sleep on it if you must. The king reached down, clasped Ned by the hand, and pulled him roughly to his feet. Just don't keep me waiting too long. I am not the most patient of men. For a moment Eddard Stark was filled with a terrible sense of foreboding. This was his place, here in the north. He looked at the stone figures all around them, breathed deep in the chill silence of the crypt. He could feel the eyes of the dead. They were all listening, he knew. And winter was coming. John. There were times, not many, but a few, when Jon Snow was glad he was a bastard. As he filled his wine cup once more from a passing flagon, it struck him that this might be one of them. He settled back in his place on the bench among the younger squires and drank. The sweet, fruity taste of summer wine filled his mouth and brought a smile to his lips. The great hall of Winterfell was hazy with smoke and heavy with the smell of roasted meat and fresh baked bread. Its grey stone walls were draped with banners. White, gold. Crimson, the dire wolf of Stark, Baratheon's crowned stag, the lion of Lannister. A singer was playing the high harp and reciting a ballad, but down at this end of the hall his voice could scarcely be heard above the roar of the fire, the clangor of pewter plates and cups, and the low mutter of a hundred drunken conversations. It was the fourth hour of the welcoming feast laid for the king. John's brothers and sisters had been seated with the royal children. Beneath the raised platform where Lord and Lady Stark hosted the king and queen. In honor of the occasion, his lord father would doubtless permit each child a glass of wine, but no more than that. Down here on the benches, there was no one to stop John drinking as much as he had a thirst for. And he was finding that he had a man's thirst, to the raucous delight of the youths around him, who urged him on every time he drained a glass. They were fine company and John relished the stories they were telling, tales of battle and bedding and the hunt. He was certain that his companions were more entertaining than the king's offspring. He had sated his curiosity about the visitors when they made their entrance. The procession had passed not a foot from the place he had been given on the bench, and John had gotten a good long look at them all. His lord father had come first, escorting the queen. She was as beautiful as men said. A jeweled tiara gleamed amidst her long golden hair, its emeralds a perfect match for the green of her eyes. His father helped her up the steps to the dais and led her to her seat, 
but the queen never so much as looked at him. Even at fourteen, John could see through her smile. Next had come King Robert himself, with Lady Stark on his arm. The king was a great disappointment to John. His father had talked of him often, the peerless Robert Baratheon, demon of the trident, the fiercest warrior of the realm, a giant among princes. John saw only a fat man, red-faced under his beard, sweating through his silks. He walked like a man half in his cups. After them came the children. Little Rickon first, managing the long walk with all the dignity a three-year-old could muster. John had to urge him on when he stopped to visit. Close behind came Rob, in grey wool trimmed with white, the stark colours. He had the princess Miss Ella on his arm. She was a wisp of a girl, not quite eight, her hair a cascade of golden curls under a jewelled net. John noticed the shy looks she gave Rob as they passed between the tables and the timid way she smiled at him. He decided she was insipid. Rob didn't even have the sense to realize how stupid she was, he was grinning like a fool. His half-sisters escorted the royal princes. Aria was paired with plump young Tommen, whose white blonde hair was longer than hers. Sansa, two years older, drew the crown prince, Joffrey Baratheon. He was twelve, younger than John nor Rob, but taller than either, to John's vast dismay. Prince Joffrey had his sister's hair and his mother's deep green eyes. A thick tangle of blonde curls dripped down past his golden choker and high velvet collar. Sansa looked radiant as she walked beside him, but John did not like Joffrey's pouty lips or the bored, disdainful way he looked at Winterfell's great hall. He was more interested in the pair that came behind him, the Queen's brothers, the Lannisters of Casterly Rock. The Lion and the Imp, there was no mistaking which was which. Sir Jaime Lannister was twin to Queen Cersei, tall and golden, with flashing green eyes and a smile that cut like a knife. He wore crimson silk, high black boots, a black satin cloak. On the breast of his tunic, the lion of his house was embroidered in gold thread, roaring its defiance. They called him the Lion of Lannister to his face and whispered Kingslayer behind his back. John found it hard to look away from him. This is what a king should look like, he thought to himself as the man passed. Then he saw the other one, waddling along half hidden by his brother's side. Tyrion Lannister, the youngest of Lord Tywin's brood and by far the ugliest. All that the gods had given to Sir Sion Jaime, they had denied Tyrion. He was a dwarf, half his brother's height, struggling to keep pace on stunted legs. His head was too large for his body with a brute's squashed in face beneath a swollen shelf of brow. One green eye and one black one peered out from under a lank fall of hair so blonde it seemed white. John watched him with fascination. The last of the High Lords to enter were his uncle, Benjamin Stark of the Night's Watch, and his father's ward, young Theon Greyjoy. Benjamin gave John a warm smile as he went by. Theon ignored him utterly, but there was nothing new in that. After all had been seated, toasts were made, thanks were given and returned, and then the feasting began. John had started drinking then, and he had not stopped. Something rubbed against his leg beneath the table. John saw red eyes staring up at him. Hungry again? he asked. There was still half a honeyed chicken in the center of the table. John reached out to tear off a leg, then had a better idea. He knifed the bird hole and let the carcass slide to the floor between his legs. Ghost tripped into it in savage silence. His brothers and sisters had not been permitted to bring their wolves to the banquet, but there were more curs than John could count at this end of the hall, and no one had said a word about his pup. He told himself he was fortunate in that too. His eyes stung. John rubbed at them savagely, cursing the smoke. He swallowed another gulp of wine and watched his dire wolf devour the chicken. Dogs moved between the tables, trailing after the serving girls. One of them, a black mongrel bitch with long yellow eyes, caught a scent of the chicken. She stopped and edged under the bench to get a share. John watched the confrontation. 
The bitch growled low in her throat and moved closer. Ghost looked up, silent, and fixed the dog with those hot red eyes. The bitch snapped an angry challenge. She was three times the size of the dire wolf pup. Ghost did not move. He stood over his prize and opened his mouth, baring his fangs. The bitch tensed, barked again, then thought better of this fight. She turned and slunk away, with one last defiant snap to save her pride. Ghost went back to his meal. John grinned and reached under the table to ruffle the shaggy white fur. The dire wolf looked up at him, nipped gently at his hand, then went back to eating. Is this one of the dire wolves I've heard so much of? A familiar voice asked close at hand. John looked up happily as his Uncle Ben put a hand on his head and ruffled his hair much as John had ruffled the wolves. Yes, he said. His name is Ghost. One of the squires interrupted the bawdy story he'd been telling to make room at the table for their lord's brother. Benjamin Stark straddled the bench with long legs and took the wine cup out of John's hand. Summer wine, he said after a taste. Nothing so sweet. How many cups have you had, John? John smiled. Ben Stark laughed. As I feared. Ah, well. I believe I was younger than you the first time I got truly and sincerely drunk. He snagged a roasted onion, dripping brown with gravy, from a nearby trencher and bit into it. It crunched. His uncle was sharp featured and gaunt as a mountain crag but there was always a hint of laughter in his blue-gray eyes. He dressed in black, as befitted a man of the night's watch. Tonight it was rich black velvet, with high leather boots and a wide belt with a silver buckle. A heavy silver chain was looped round his neck. Benjamin watched Ghost with amusement as he ate his onion. A very quiet wolf, he observed. He's not like the others, John said. He never makes a sound. That's why I named him Ghost. That, and because he's white. The others are all dark, gray or black. There are still dire wolves beyond the wall. We hear them on our engines. Benjamin Stark gave John a long look. Don't you usually eat at table with your brothers? Most times, John answered in a flat voice. But tonight Lady Stark thought it might give insult to the royal family to see a bastard among them. I see. His uncle glanced over his shoulder at the raised table at the far end of the hall. My brother does not seem very festive tonight. John had noticed that too. A bastard had to learn to notice things, to read the truth that people hid behind their eyes. His father was observing all the courtesies, but there was tightness in him that John had seldom seen before. He said little, looking out over the hall with hooded eyes, seeing nothing. Two seats away, the king had been drinking heavily all night. His broad face was flushed behind his great black beard. He made many a toast, laughed loudly at every jest, and attacked each dish like a starving man, but beside him the queen seemed as cold as an ice sculpture. The queen is angry too, John told his uncle in a low, quiet voice. Father took the king down to the crypts this afternoon. The queen didn't want him to go. Benjamin gave John a careful, measuring look. You don't miss much, do you, John? We could use a man like you on the wall. John swelled with pride. Rob is a stronger lance than I am, but I'm the better sword, and Helen says I sit a horse as well as anyone in the castle. Notable achievements. Take me with you when you go back to the wall, John said in a sudden rush. Father will give me leave to go if you ask him, I know he will. Uncle Benjamin studied his face carefully. The wall is a hard place for a boy, John. I am almost a man grown, John protested. I will turn fifteen on my next name day, and Master Lewin says bastards grow up faster than other children. That's true enough, Benjamin said with a downward twist of his mouth. He took John's cup from the table filled it fresh from a nearby pitcher, and drank down a long swallow. Daron Targaryen was only fourteen when he conquered Dawn, John said. The young dragon was one of his heroes. A conquest that lasted a summer, his uncle pointed out. 
your boy king lost 10,000 men taking the place, and another 50 trying to hold it. Someone should have told him that war isn't a game. He took another sip of wine. Also, he said, wiping his mouth, Darren Targaryen was only 18 when he died. Or have you forgotten that part? I forget nothing, John boasted. The wine was making him bold. He tried to sit very straight, to make himself seem taller. I want to serve in the night's watch, uncle. He had thought on it long and hard, lying abed at night while his brothers slept around him. Rob would someday inherit Winterfell, would command great armies as the Warden of the North. Bran and Rickon would be Rob's bannermen and rule holdfasts in his name. His sisters Arya and Sansa would marry the heirs of other great houses and go south as mistress of castles of their own. But what place could a bastard hope to earn? You don't know what you're asking, John. The Night's Watch is a sworn brotherhood. We have no families. None of us will ever father sons. Our wife is duty. Our mistress is honor. A bastard can have honor too, John said. I am ready to swear your oath. You are a boy of fourteen, Benjamin said. Not a man, not yet. Until you have known a woman, you cannot understand what you would be giving up. I don't care about that. John said hotly. You might, if you knew what it meant, Benjamin said. If you knew what the oath would cost you, you might be less eager to pay the price, son. John felt anger rise inside him. I'm not your son. Benjamin Stark stood up. More's the pity. He put a hand on John's shoulder. Come back to me after you've fathered a few bastards of your own, and we'll see how you feel. John trembled. I will never father a bastard, he said carefully. Never. He spat it out like venom. Suddenly he realized that the table had fallen silent, and they were all looking at him. He felt the tears begin to well behind his eyes. He pushed himself to his feet. I must be excused, he said with the last of his dignity. He whirled and bolted before they could see him cry. He must have drunk more wine than he had realized. His feet got tangled under him as he tried to leave, and he lurched sideways into a serving girl and sent a flagon of spiced wine crashing to the floor. Laughter boomed all around him, and John felt hot tears on his cheeks. Someone tried to steady him. He wrenched free of their grip and ran, half blind, for the door. Ghost followed close at his heels, out into the night. The yard was quiet and empty. A lone sentry stood high on the battlements of the inner wall, his cloak pulled tight around him against the cold. He looked bored and miserable as he huddled there alone, but John would have traded places with him in an instant. Otherwise the castle was dark and deserted. John had seen an abandoned hold fast once, a drear place where nothing moved but the wind and the stones kept silent about whatever people had lived there. Winterfell reminded him of that tonight. The sounds of music and song spilled through the open windows behind him. They were the last things John wanted to hear. He wiped away his tears on the sleeve of his shirt, furious that he had let them fall, and turned to go. Boy, a voice called out to him. John turned. Tyrion Lannister was sitting on the ledge above the door to the Great Hall, looking for all the world like a gargoyle. The dwarf grinned down at him. Is that animal a wolf? A dire wolf, John said. His name is Ghost. He stared up at the little man, his disappointment suddenly forgotten. What are you doing up there? Why aren't you at the feast? Too hot, too noisy, and I drunk too much wine, the dwarf told him. I learned long ago that it is considered rude to vomit on your brother. Might I have a closer look at your wolf? John hesitated then nodded slowly. Can you climb down, or shall I bring a ladder? Oh, bleed that, the little man said. He pushed himself off the ledge into empty air. John gasped, then watched with awe as Tyrion Lannister spun around in a tight ball, landed lightly on his hands, then vaulted backward onto his legs. Ghost backed away from him uncertainly. The dwarf dusted himself off and laughed. I believe I frightened your wolf. 
My apologies. He's not scared, John said. He knelt and called out. Ghost, come here. Come on. That's it. The wolf pup padded closer and nuzzled at John's face, but he kept a wary eye on Tyrion Lannister, and when the dwarf reached out to pet him, he drew back and bared his fangs in a silent snarl. Shy, isn't he? Lannister observed. Sit, ghost, John commanded. That's it. Keep still. He looked up at the dwarf. You can touch him now. He won't move until I tell him to. I've been training him. I see, Lannister said. He ruffled the snow white fur between ghost's ears and said, Nice wolf. If I wasn't here, he'd tear out your throat, John said. It wasn't actually true yet, but it would be. In that case, you had best stay close, the dwarf said. He cocked his oversized head to one side and looked John over with his mismatched eyes. I am Tyrion Lannister. I know, John said. He rose. Standing, he was taller than the dwarf. It made him feel strange. You're Ned Stark's bastard, aren't you? John felt a coldness pass right through him. He pressed his lips together and said nothing. Did I offend you? Lannister said. Sorry. Dwarfs don't have to be tactful. Generations of capering fools in Motley have won me the right to dress badly and say any damn thing that comes into my head. He grinned. You are the bastard, though. Lord Eddard Stark is my father, John admitted stiffly. Lannister studied his face. Yes, he said. I can see it. You have more of the North in you than your brothers. Half brothers, John corrected. He was pleased by the dwarf's comment, but he tried not to let it show. Let me give you some counsel, bastard, Lannister said. Never forget what you are, for surely the world will not. Make it your strength. Then it can never be your weakness. Armor yourself in it, and it will never be used to hurt you. John was in no mood for anyone's counsel. What do you know about being a bastard? All dwarfs are bastards in their father's eyes. You are your mother's true born son of Lannister. Am I? The dwarf replied, sardonic. Do tell my lord father. My mother died birthing me, and he's never been sure. I don't even know who my mother was, John said. Some woman, no doubt. Most of them are. He favored John with a rueful grin. Remember this, boy. All dwarfs may be bastards, yet not all bastards need be dwarfs. And with that he turned and sauntered back into the feast, whistling a tune. When he opened the door, the light from within threw his shadow clear across the yard, and for just a moment Tyrion Lannister stood tall as a king. Catelyn. Of all the rooms in Winterfell's great keep, Catelyn's bedchambers were the hottest. She seldom had to light a fire. The castle had been built over natural hot springs, and the scalding waters rushed through its walls and chambers like blood through a man's body, driving the chill from the stone halls, filling the glass gardens with a moist warmth, keeping the earth from freezing. Open pools smoked day and night in a dozen small courtyards. That was a little thing, in summer, in winter, it was the difference between life and death. Catelyn's bath was always hot and steaming, and her walls warm to the touch. The warmth reminded her of Riverun, of days in the sun with Lizza and Ed Muir, but Ned could never abide the heat. The Starks were made for the cold, he would tell her, and she would laugh and tell him in that case they had certainly built their castle in the wrong place. So when they had finished, Ned rolled off and climbed from her bed, as he had a thousand times before. He crossed the room, pulled back the heavy tapestries, and threw open the high narrow windows one by one, letting the night air into the chamber. The wind swirled around him as he stood facing the dark, naked and empty-handed. Catelyn pulled the furs to her chin and watched him. He looked somehow smaller and more vulnerable, like the youth she had wed in the sceptered river on, fifteen long years gone. Her loins still ached from the urgency of his lovemaking. It was a good ache. She could feel his seed within her. She prayed that it might quicken there. 
It had been three years since Rikon. She was not too old. She could give him another son. I will refuse him, Nedda said as he turned back to her. His eyes were haunted, his voice thick with doubt. Catelyn sat up in the bed. You cannot. You must not. My duties are here in the north. I have no wish to be Robert's hand. He will not understand that. He is a king now, and kings are not like other men. If you refuse to serve him, he will wonder why, and sooner or later he will begin to suspect that you oppose him. Can't you see the danger that would put us in? Ned shook his head, refusing to believe. Robert would never harm me or any of mine. We were closer than brothers. He loves me. If I refuse him, he will roar and curse and bluster, and in a week we will laugh about it together. I know the man. You knew the man, she said. The king is a stranger to you. Catelyn remembered the dire wolf dead in the snow, the broken antler lodged deep in her throat. She had to make him see. Pride is everything to a king, my lord. Robert came all this way to see you, to bring you these great honors, you cannot throw them back in his face. Honors? Ned laughed bitterly. In his eyes, yes, she said. And in yours? And in mine, she blazed angry now. Why couldn't he see? He offers his own son in marriage to our daughter, what else would you call that? Sansa might someday be queen. Her sons could rule from the wall to the mountains of dawn. What is so wrong with that? Gods, Catelyn, Sansa is only eleven, Nedda said. And Joffrey. Dot. Joffrey is. Dot. She finished for him. Dot. Crown Prince and heir to the Iron Throne. And I was only twelve when my father promised me to your brother Brandon. That brought a bit a twist to Ned's mouth. Brandon. Yes. Brandon would know what to do. He always did. It was all meant for Brandon. You, Winterfell, everything. He was born to be a king's hand and a father to queens. I never asked for this cup to pass to me. Perhaps not, Catelyn said but Brandon is dead, and the cup has passed, and you must drink from it, like it or not. Ned turned away from her, back to the night. He stood staring out in the darkness, watching the moon and the stars perhaps, or perhaps the sentries on the wall. Catelyn softened then, to see his pain. Eddard Stark had married her in Brandon's place, as custom decreed, but the shadow of his dead brother still lay between them, as did the other the shadow of the woman he would not name, the woman who had borne him his bastard son. She was about to go to him when the knock came at the door, loud and unexpected. Ned turned, frowning. What is it? Desmond's voice came through the door. My lord, Master Lewin is without and begs urgent audience. You told him I had left orders not to be disturbed? Yes, my lord. He insists. Very well. Send him in. Ned crossed to the wardrobe and slipped on a heavy robe. Catelyn realized suddenly how cold it had become. She sat up in bed and pulled the furs to her chin. Perhaps we should close the windows, she suggested. Ned nodded absently. Master Lewin was shown in. The master was a small grey man. His eyes were grey, and quick, and saw much. His hair was grey, what little the years had left him. His robe was grey wool, trimmed with white fur, the stark colours. Its great floppy sleeves had pockets hidden inside. Leuven was always tucking things into those sleeves and producing other things from them, books, messages, strange artefacts, toys for the children. With all he kept hidden in his sleeves, Catelyn was surprised that Master Leuven could lift his arms at all. The master waited until the door had closed behind him before he spoke. My lord, he said to Ned, pardon for disturbing your rest. I have been left a message. Ned looked irritated. Been left? By whom? Has there been a rider? I was not told. There was no rider, my lord. Only a carved wooden box, left on a table in my observatory while I napped. My servants saw no one but it must have been brought by someone in the king's party. 
We have had no other visitors from the south. A wooden box, you say? Catelyn said. Inside was a fine new lens for the observatory, from Mir by the look of it. The lens crafters of Mir are without equal. Ned frowned. He had little patience for this sort of thing, Catelyn knew. A lens, he said. What has that to do with me? I asked the same question, Master Lewin said. Clearly there was more to this than the seeming. Under the heavy weight of her furs, Catelyn shivered. A lens is an instrument to help us see. Indeed it is. He fingered the collar of his order, a heavy chain worn tight around the neck beneath his robe, each link forged from a different metal. Catelyn could feel dread stirring inside her once again. What is it that they would have us see more clearly? The very thing I asked myself. Master Lewin drew a tightly rolled paper out of his sleeve. I found the true message concealed within a false bottom when I dismantled the box the lens had come in, but it is not for my eyes. Ned held out his hand. Let me have it, then. Lewin did not stir. Pardons, my lord. The message is not for you either. It is marked for the eyes of the Lady Catelyn, and her alone. May I approach? Catelyn nodded, not trusting to speak. The master placed the paper on the table beside the bed. It was sealed with a small blob of blue wax. Lewin bowed and began to retreat. Stay, Ned commanded him. His voice was grave. He looked at Catelyn. What is it? My lady, you're shaking. I'm afraid, she admitted. She reached out and took the letter in trembling hands. The furs dropped away from her nakedness, forgotten. In the blue wax was the moon and falcon seal of Hauserin. It's from Lisa. Catelyn looked at her husband. It will not make us glad, she told him. There is grief in this message, Ned. I can feel it. Ned frowned, his face darkening. Open it. Catelyn broke the seal. Her eyes moved over the words. At first they made no sense to her. Then she remembered. Lisa took no chances. When we were girls together, we had a private language, she and I. Can you read it? Yes, Catelyn admitted. Then tell us. Perhaps I should withdraw, Master Lewin said. No, Catelyn said. We will need your counsel. She threw back the furs and climbed from the bed. The night air was as cold as the grave on her bare skin as she padded across the room. Master Lewin averted his eyes. Even Ned looked shocked. What are you doing? he asked. Lighting a fire, Catelyn told him. She found a dressing gown and shrugged into it, then knelt over the cold hearth. Master Lewin, Ned began. Master Lewin has delivered all my children, Catelyn said. This is no time for false modesty. She slid the paper in among the kindling and placed the heavier logs on top of it. Ned crossed the room, took her by the arm, and pulled her to her feet. He held her there, his face inches from her. My lady, tell me. What was this message? Catelyn stiffened in his grasp. A warning, she said softly. If we have the wits to hear. His eyes searched her face. Go on. Lizza says John Nirin was murdered. His fingers tightened on her arm. By whom? The Lannisters, she told him. The Queen. Ned released his hold on her arm. There were deep red marks on her skin. Gods, he whispered. His voice was hoarse. Your sister is sick with grief. She cannot know what she is saying. She knows, Catelyn said. Lizzo is impulsive, yes, but this message was carefully planned, cleverly hidden. She knew it meant death if her letter fell into the wrong hands. To risk so much she must have had more than mere suspicion. Catelyn looked to her husband. Now we truly have no choice. You must be Robert's hand. You must go south with him and learn the truth. She saw at once that Ned had reached a very different conclusion. The only truths I know are here. The south is a nest of adders I would do better to avoid. Leuven plucked at his chain collar where it had chafed the soft skin of his throat. The hand of the king has great power, my lord. Power to find the truth of Lord Rin's death, 
to bring his killers to the king's justice. Power to protect Lady Arin and her son, if the worst be true. Ned glanced helplessly around the bedchamber. Catelyn's heart went out to him, but she knew she could not take him in her arms just then. First the victory must be won, for her children's sake. You say you love Robert like a brother. Would you leave your brother surrounded by Lannisters? The others take both of you, Ned muttered darkly. He turned away from them and went to the window. She did not speak, nor did the master. They waited, quiet, while Eddard Stark said a silent farewell to the home he loved. When he turned away from the window at last, his voice was tired and full of melancholy, and moisture glittered faintly in the corners of his eyes. My father went south once, to answer the summons of a king. He never came home again. A different time, Master Lewin said. A different king. Yes, Nedda said dully. He seated himself in a chair by the hearth. Catelyn, you shall stay here in Winterfell. His words were like an icy draught through her heart. No, she said, suddenly afraid. Was this to be her punishment? Never to see his face again, nor to feel his arms around her? Yes, Nedda said, in words that would brook no argument. You must govern the North in my stead, while I run Robert's errands. There must always be a Stark in Winterfell. Rob is fourteen. Soon enough, he will be a man grown. He must learn to rule, and I will not be here for him. Make him part of your councils. He must be ready when his time comes. God's will, not for many years, Master Lewin murmured. Master Lewin, I trust you as I would my own blood. Give my wife your voice in all things great and small. Teach my son the things he needs to know. Winter is coming? Master Lewin nodded gravely. Then silence fell, until Catelyn found her courage and asked the question whose answer she most dreaded. What of the other children? Nedda stood, and took her in his arms, and held her face close to his. Rickon is very young, he said gently. He should stay here with you and Rob. The others I would take with me. I could not bear it, Catelyn said, trembling. You must, he said. Sansa must wed Joffrey, that is clear now, we must give them no grounds to suspect our devotion. And it is past time that Arya learned the ways of a Southron court. In a few years she will be of an age to marry too. Sansa would shine in the south, Catelyn thought to herself, and the gods knew that Arya needed refinement. Reluctantly, she let go of them in her heart. But not Bran. Never Bran. Yes, she said, but please, Ned, for the love you bear me, let Bran remain here at Winterfell. He is only seven. I was eight when my father sent me to foster at the Eyrie, Nedda said. Sir Roderick tells me there is bad feeling between Rob and Prince Joffrey. That is not healthy. Bran can bridge that distance. He is a sweet boy, quick to laugh, easy to love. Let him grow up with the young princes, let him become their friend as Robert became mine. Our house will be the safer for it. He was right, Catelyn knew it. It did not make the pain any easier to bear. She would lose all four of them, then, Ned, and both girls, and her sweet, loving Bran. Only Robin Little Rickon would be left to her. She felt lonely already. Winterfell was such a vast place. Keep him off the walls, then, she said bravely. You know how Bran loves to climb. Ned kissed the tears from her eyes before they could fall. Thank you, my lady, he whispered. This is hard, I know. What of Jon Snow, my lord? Master Lewin asked. Catelyn tensed at the mention of the name. Ned felt the anger in her, and pulled away. Many men fathered bastards. Catelyn had grown up with that knowledge. It came as no surprise to her, in the first year of her marriage, to learn that Ned had fathered a child on some girl chance met on campaign. He had a man's needs, after all, and they had spent that year apart, Ned off at war in the south while she remained safe in her father's castle at Riveron. Her thoughts were more of Rob, the infant at her breast, than of the husband she scarcely knew. 
he was welcome to whatever solace he might find between battles. And if his seed quickened, she expected he would see to the child's needs. He did more than that. The Starks were not like other men. Ned brought his bastard home with him, and called him son for all the North to see. When the wars were over at last, and Catlin rode to Winterfell, John and his wet nurse had already taken up residence. That cut deep. Ned would not speak of the mother, not so much as a word, but a castle has no secrets, and Catelyn heard her maids repeating tales they heard from the lips of her husband's soldiers. They whispered of Sir Arthur Dane, the sword of the morning, deadliest of the seven knights of Ares is King's Guard, and of how their young lord had slain him in single combat. And they told how afterward Ned had carried Sir Arthur's sword back to the beautiful young sister who awaited him in a castle called Starfall on the shores of the Summer Sea. The Lady of Sharadane, tall and fair, with haunting violet eyes. It had taken her a fortnight to marshal her courage, but finally, in bed one night, Catelyn had asked her husband the truth of it, asked him to his face. That was the only time in all their years that Ned had ever frightened her. Never ask me about John, he said, cold as ice. He is my blood, and that is all you need to know. And now I will learn where you heard that name, my lady. She had pledged to obey, she told him, and from that day on, the whispering had stopped, and Ashara Dane's name was never heard in Winterfell again. Whoever John's mother had been, Ned must have loved her fiercely, for nothing Catelyn said would persuade him to send the boy away. It was the one thing she could never forgive him. She had come to love her husband with all her heart, but she had never found it in her to love John. She might have overlooked a dozen bastards for Ned's sake, so long as they were out of sight. John was never out of sight, and as he grew, he looked more like Ned than any of the true born sons she bore him. Somehow that made it worse. John must go, she said now. He and Rob are close, Ned said. I had hoped. Dot. He cannot stay here, Catelyn said, cutting him off. He is your son, not mine. I will not have him. It was hard, she knew, but no less the truth. Ned would do the boy no kindness by leaving him here at Winterfell. The look Ned gave her was anguished. You know I cannot take him south. There will be no place for him at court. A boy with a bastard's name. Dot. You know what they will say of him. He will be shunned. Catelyn armored her heart against the mute appeal in her husband's eyes. They say your friend Robert has fathered a dozen bastards himself. And none of them has ever been seen at court. Ned blazed. The Lannister woman has seen to that. How can you be so damnably cruel, Catelyn? He is only a boy. He, his fury was on him. He might have said more and worse, but Master Lewin cut in. Another solution presents itself, he said, his voice quiet. Your brother Benjamin came to me about John a few days ago. It seems the boy aspires to take the black. Ned looked shocked. He asked to join the Night's Watch. Catelyn said nothing. Let Ned work it out in his own mind, her voice would not be welcome now. Yet gladly would she have kissed the Master just then. His was the perfect solution. Benjamin Stark was a sworn brother. John would be a son to him, the child he would never have. And in time the boy would take the oath as well. He would father no sons who might someday contest with Catelyn's own grandchildren for Winterfell. Master Lewin said, There is great honor in service on the wall, my lord. And even a bastard may rise high in the night's watch, Ned reflected. Still, his voice was troubled. John is so young. If he asked this when he was a man grown, that would be one thing, but a boy of fourteen. Dot. A hard sacrifice, Master Lewin agreed. Yet these are hard times, my lord. His road is no crueler than yours or your lady's. Catelyn thought of the three children she must lose. It was not easy keeping silent then. Ned turned away from them to gaze out the window, his long face silent and thoughtful. Finally he sighed, and turned back. Very well, he said to Master Lewin. 
I suppose it is for the best. I will speak to Ben. When shall we tell John? The master asked. When I must. Preparations must be made. It will be a fortnight before we are ready to depart. I would sooner let John enjoy these last few days. Summer will end soon enough, and childhood as well. When the time comes, I will tell him myself. Area. Area's stitches were crooked again. She frowned down at them with dismay and glanced over to where her sister Sansa sat among the other girls. Sansa's needlework was exquisite. Everyone said so. Sansa's work is as pretty as she is, Septa Mordain told their lady mother once. She has such fine, delicate hands. When Lady Catelyn had asked about Aria, the scepter had sniffed. Aria has the hands of a blacksmith. Aria glanced furtively across the room, worried that Septim Mordain might have read her thoughts, but the scepter was paying her no attention today. She was sitting with the Princess Missella, all smiles and admiration. It was not often that the scepter was privileged to instruct a royal princess in the womanly arts, as she had said when the Queen brought Missella to join them. Aria thought that Missella's stitches looked a little crooked too but you would never know it from the way Septa Mordain was cooing. She studied her own work again, looking for some way to salvage it, then sighed and put down the needle. She looked glumly at her sister. Sansa was chatting away happily as she worked. Beth Castle, Sir Roderick's little girl, was sitting by her feet, listening to every word she said, and Jean Poole was leaning over to whisper something in her ear. What are you talking about? Ariel asked suddenly. Jean gave her a startled look, then giggled. Sansa looked abashed. Beth blushed. No one answered. Tell me, Arius said. Jean glanced over to make certain that Scepter Mordain was not listening. Miss Ella said something then, and the Scepter laughed along with the rest of the ladies. We were talking about the prince, Sansa said, her voice soft as a kiss. Aria knew which prince she meant, Jofty, of course. The tall, handsome one. Sansa got to sit with him at the feast. Aria had to sit with the little fat one. Naturally. Joffrey likes your sister, Jean whispered, proud as if she had something to do with it. She was the daughter of Winterfell's steward and Sansa's dearest friend. He told her she was very beautiful. He's going to marry her, little Beth said dreamily hugging herself. Then Sansa will be queen of all the realm. Sansa had a grace to blush. She blushed prettily. She did everything prettily, Aria thought with dull resentment. Beth, you shouldn't make up stories, Sansa corrected the younger girl, gently stroking her hair to take the harshness out of her words. She looked at Aria. What did you think of Prince Joff, sister? He's very gallant, don't you think? John says he looks like a girl, Arius said. Sansa sighed as she stitched. Poor John, she said. He gets jealous because he's a bastard. He's our brother, Arius said, much too loudly. Her voice cut through the afternoon quiet of the tower room. Septa Mordain raised her eyes. She had a bony face, sharp eyes, and a thin lipless mouth made for frowning. It was frowning now. What are you talking about, children? Our half-brother, Sansa corrected, soft and precise. She smiled for the scepter. Aria and I were remarking on how pleased we were to have the princess with us today, she said. Scepter Mordain nodded. Indeed. A great honor for us all. Princess Missella smiled uncertainly at the compliment. Aria, why aren't you at work? The scepter asked. She rose to her feet, starched skirts rustling as she started across the room. Let me see your stitches. Aria wanted to scream. It was just like Sansa to go and attract the scepter's attention. Here, she said, surrendering up her work. The scepter examined the fabric. Aria, 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 she said. This will not do. This will not do at all. Everyone was looking at her. It was too much. Sansa was too well bred to smile at her sister's disgrace, but Jean was smirking on her behalf. 
even Princess Missella looked sorry for her. Aria felt tears filling her eyes. She pushed herself out of her chair and bolted for the door. Septim Mordain called after her. Aria, come back here. Don't you take another step. Your lady mother will hear of this. In front of our royal princess too. You'll shame us all. Aria stopped at the door and turned back, biting her lip. The tears were running down her cheeks now. She managed a stiff little bow to Miss Ella. By your leave, my lady. Miss Ella blinked at her and looked to her ladies for guidance. But if she was uncertain, Septim Mordain was not. Just where do you think you are going, Aria? The Scepter demanded. Aria glared at her. I have to go shoe a horse, she said sweetly, taking a brief satisfaction in the shock on the Scepter's face. Then she whirled and made her exit, running down the steps as fast as her feet would take her. It wasn't fair. Sansa had everything. Sansa was two years older, maybe by the time Aria had been born, there had been nothing left. Often it felt that way. Sansa could sew and dance and sing. She wrote poetry. She knew how to dress. She played the high harp and the bells. Worse, she was beautiful. Sansa had gotten their mother's fine high cheekbones and the thick auburn hair of the Tullys. Aria took after their lord father. Her hair was a lustreless brown, and her face was long and solemn. Jean used to call her Aria horsey face, and nay whenever she came near. It hurt that the one thing Aria could do better than her sister was ride a horse. Well, that and manage a household. Sansu had never had much of a head for figures. If she did marry Prince Joff, Aria hoped for his sake that he had a good steward. Nymeria was waiting for her in the guardroom at the base of the stairs. She bounded to her feet as soon as she caught sight of Aria. Aria grinned. The wolf pup loved her, even if no one else did. They went everywhere together, and Nymeria slept in her room, at the foot of her bed. If mother had not forbidden it, Aria would gladly have taken the wolf with her to needlework. Let Septa Mordain complain about her stitches then. Nymeria nipped eagerly at her hand as Aria untied her. She had yellow eyes. When they caught the sunlight, they gleamed like two golden coins. Aria had named her after the warrior queen of the Rhoyne, who had led her people across the narrow sea. That had been a great scandal too. Sansa, of course, had named her pup lady. Aria made a face and hugged the wolfling tight. Nymeria licked her ear, and she giggled. By now Septa Mordain would certainly have sent word to her lady mother. If she went to her room, they would find her. Aria did not care to be found. She had a better notion. The boys were at practice in the yard. She wanted to see Rob put gallant Prince Joffrey flat on his back. Come, she whispered to Nymeria. She got up and ran, the wolf coming hard at her heels. There was a window in the covered bridge between the armory and the great keep where you had a view of the whole yard. That was where they headed. They arrived, flushed and breathless, to find John seated on the sill, one leg drawn up languidly to his chin. He was watching the action, so absorbed that he seemed unaware of her approach until his white wolf moved to meet them. Nymeria stalked closer on wary feet. Ghost, already larger than his litter mates smelt her, gave her ear a careful nip, and settled back down. John gave her a curious look. Shouldn't you be working on your stitches, little sister? Aria made a face at him. I wanted to see them fight. He smiled. Come here, then. Aria climbed up on the window and sat beside him, to a chorus of thuds and grunts from the yard below. To her disappointment, it was the younger boys drilling. Bran was so heavily padded he looked as though he had belted on a feather bed, and Prince Tommen, who was plump to begin with, seemed positively round. They were huffing and puffing and hitting at each other with padded wooden swords under the watchful eye of old Sir Audric Castle, the master at arms, a great stout keg of a man with magnificent white cheek whiskers. A dozen spectators, man and boy, were calling out encouragement, Rob's voice the loudest among them. She spotted Theon Greyjoy beside him, 
his black doublet emblazoned with the golden kraken of his house, a look of right contempt on his face. Both of the combatants were staggering. Aria judged that they had been at it a while. A shade more exhausting than needlework, John observed. A shade more fun than needlework, Aria gave back at him. John grinned, reached over, and messed up her hair. Aria flushed. They had always been close. John had their father's face, as she did. They were the only ones. Robin Sansel and Bran and even little Rickon all took after the Tullys, with easy smiles and fire in their hair. When Aria had been little, she had been afraid that meant that she was a bastard too. It been John she had gone to in her fear, and John who had reassured her. Why aren't you down in the yard? Aria asked him. He gave her a half smile. Bastards are not allowed to damage young princes, he said. Any bruises they take in the practice yard must come from true born swords. Oh! Aria felt abashed. She should have realized. For the second time today, Aria reflected that life was not fair. She watched her little brother whack at Tommen. I could do just as good as Bran, she said. He's only seven. I'm nine. John looked her over with all his fourteen year old wisdom. You're too skinny he said. He took her arm to feel her muscle. Then he sighed and shook his head. I doubt you could even lift a long sword, little sister, never mind swing one. Aria snatched back her arm and glared at him. John messed up her hair again. They watched Bran and Tom encircle each other. You see Prince Joffrey? John asked. She hadn't, not at first glance, but when she looked again she found him to the back under the shade of the high stone wall. He was surrounded by men she did not recognize, young squires in the livery of Lannister and Baratheon, strangers all. There were a few older men among them, knights, she surmised. Look at the arms on his surcoat, John suggested. Aria looked. An ornate shield had been embroidered on the prince's padded circuit. No doubt the needlework was exquisite. The arms were divided down the middle, on one side was the crowned stag of the royal house, on the other the lion of Lannister. The Lannisters are proud, John observed. You'd think the royal sigil would be sufficient, but number. He makes his mother's house equal in honor to the king's. The woman is important too. Aria protested. John chuckled. Perhaps you should do the same thing, little sister. Wed Tully to Stark in your arms. A wolf with a fish in its mouth? It made her laugh. That would look silly. Besides, if a girl can't fight, why should she have a coat of arms? John shrugged. Girls get the arms but not the swords. Bastards get the swords but not the arms. I did not make the rules, little sister. There was a shout from the courtyard below. Prince Tommen was rolling in the dust trying to get up and failing. All the padding made him look like a turtle on its back. Bran was standing over him with upraised wooden sword, ready to whack him again once he regained his feet. The men began to laugh. Enough! Sir Audric called out. He gave the prince a hand and yanked him back to his feet. Well fought. Lou, Donis, help them out of their armor. He looked around. Prince Joffrey, Rob, Will you go another round? Rob, already sweaty from a previous bout, moved forward eagerly. Gladly. Joffrey moved into the sunlight in response to Roderick's summons. His hair shone like spun gold. He looked bored. This is a game for children, Sir Roderick. Theon Greyjoy gave a sudden bark of laughter. You are children, he said derisively. Rob may be a child, Joffrey said. I am a prince. And I grow tired of swatting at Starks with a play sword. You got more swats than you gave, Joff, Rob said. Are you afraid? Prince Joffrey looked at him. Oh, terrified, he said. You're so much older. Some of the Lannister men laughed. John looked down on the scene with a frown. Joffrey is truly a little shit, he told Aria. Sir Roderick tugged thoughtfully at his white whiskers. What are you suggesting? 
he asked the prince. Live steel. Done, Rob shot back. You'll be sorry. The master at arms put a hand on Rob's shoulder to quiet him. Live steel is too dangerous. I will permit you to earn swords, with blunted edges. Joffrey said nothing, but a man strange to area, a tall knight with black hair and burn scars on his face, pushed forward in front of the prince. This is your prince. Who are you to tell him he may not have an edge on his sword, sir? Master at arms of Winterfell, Clegane, and you would do well not to forget it. Are you training women here? The burned man wanted to know. He was muscled like a bull. I am training knights, Sir Audric said pointedly. They will have steel when they are ready. When they are of an age. The burned man looked at Rob. How old are you, boy? Fourteen, Rob said. I killed a man at twelve. You can be sure it was not with a blunt sword. Aria could see Rob bristle. His pride was wounded. He turned on Sir Audric. Let me do it. I can beat him. Beat him with a tourney blade, then, Sir Audric said. Joffrey shrugged. Come and see me when you're older, Stark. If you're not too old. There was laughter from the Lannister men. Rob's curses rang through the yard. Arya covered her mouth in shock. Theon Greyjoy seized Rob's arm to keep him away from the prince. Sir Audric tugged at his whiskers in dismay. Joffrey feigned a yawn and turned to his younger brother. Come, Tommen, he said. The hour of play is done. Leave the children to their frolics. That brought more laughter from the Lannisters, more curses from Rob. Sir Audric's face was betrayed with fury under the white of his whiskers. Theon kept Rob locked in an iron grip until the princes and their party were safely away. John watched them leave, and Arya watched John. His face had grown as still as the pool at the heart of the godswood. Finally he climbed down off the window. The show is done, he said. He bent to scratch Ghost behind the ears. The white wool froze and rubbed against him. You had best run back to your room, little sister. Septa Mordain will surely be lurking. The longer you hide, the sterner the penance. You'll be sowing all through winter. When the spring thaw comes, they will find your body with the needle still locked tight between your frozen fingers. Aria didn't think it was funny. I hate needlework, she said with passion. It's not fair. Nothing is fair, John said. He messed up her hair again and walked away from her, ghost moving silently beside him. Nymeria started to follow too, then stopped and came back when she saw that Aria was not coming. Reluctantly she turned in the other direction. It was worse than John had thought. It wasn't Septa Mordain waiting in her room. It was Septa Mordain and her mother. Bran. The hunt left at dawn. The king wanted wild boar at the feast tonight. Prince Joffrey rode with his father, so Rob had been allowed to join the hunters as well. Uncle Benjen, Jory, Theon Greyjoy, Sir Audric, and even the Queen's funny little brother had all ridden out with them. It was the last hunt, after all. On the morrow they left for the south. Bran had been left behind with John and the girls and Rickon. But Rickon was only a baby and the girls were only girls and John and his wolf were nowhere to be found. Bran did not look for him very hard. He thought John was angry at him. John seemed to be angry at everyone these days. Bran did not know why. He was going with Uncle Ben to the wall, to join the Night's Watch. That was almost as good as going south with the king. Rob was the one they were leaving behind, not John. For days. Bran could scarcely wait to be off. He was going to ride the king's road on a horse of his own, not a pony but a real horse. His father would be the hand of the king, and they were going to live in the red castle at King's Landing, the castle the dragon lords had built. Old Nan said there were ghosts there, and dungeons where terrible things had been done, and dragon heads on the walls. It gave Bran a shiver just to think of it, but he was not afraid. How could he be afraid? His father would be with him, and the king with all his knights and sworn swords. 
Bran was going to be a knight himself someday, one of the king's guard. Old Nan said they were the finest swords in all the realm. There were only seven of them, and they wore white armor and had no wives or children, but lived only to serve the king. Bran knew all the stories. Their names were like music to him. Sir Wynne of the Mirror Shield. Sir I am Redwine. Prince Emon the Dragon Knight. The twins Sir Eric and Sir Eric, who had died on one another's swords hundreds of years ago, when brother fought sister in the war the singers called the Dance of the Dragons. The White Bull, Gerald Hightower. Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning. Baristan the Bold. Two of the King's Guard had come north with King Robert. Bran had watched them with fascination, never quite daring to speak to them. Sir Baris was a bold man with a jowly face, and Sir Merin had droopy eyes and a beard the color of rust. Sir Jaime Lannister looked more like the knights in the stories, and he was of the King's Guard too, but Rob said he had killed the old mad king and shouldn't count any more. The greatest living knight was Sir Baristan Selmy. Baristan the Bold, the Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Father had promised that they would meet Sir Baristan when they reached King's Landing, and Bran had been marking the days on his wall, eager to depart, to see a world he had only dreamed of and begin a life he could scarcely imagine. Yet now that the last day was at hand, suddenly Bran felt lost. Winterfell had been the only home he had ever known. His father had told him that he ought to say his farewells today, and he had tried. After the hunt had ridden out, he wandered through the castle with his wolf at his side, intending to visit the ones who would be left behind, old Nan and Gage the cook, Micken in his smithy, Hodor the stable boy who smiled so much and took care of his pony and never said anything but Hodor, the man in the glass gardens who gave him a blackberry when he came to visit. Dot but it was no good. He had gone to the stable first, and seen his pony there in its stall, except it wasn't his pony anymore, he was getting a real horse and leaving the pony behind, and all of a sudden Bran just wanted to sit down and cry. He turned and ran off before Hodor and the other stable boys could see the tears in his eyes. That was the end of his farewells. Instead Bran spent the morning alone in the godswood, trying to teach his wolf to fetch a stick, and failing. The wolfling was smarter than any of the hounds in his father's kennel and Bran would have sworn he understood every word that was said to him, but he showed very little interest in chasing sticks. He was still trying to decide on a name. Rob was calling his grey wind, because he ran so fast. Sansu had named hers Lady, and Arya named hers after some old witch queen in the songs and little Rickon called his shaggy dog, which Bran thought was a pretty stupid name for a dire wolf. John's wolf, the white one, was ghost. Bran wished he had thought of that first, even though his wolf wasn't white. He had tried a hundred names in the last fortnight, but none of them sounded right. Finally he got tired of the stick game and decided to go climbing. He hadn't been up to the broken tower for weeks with everything that had happened and this might be his last chance. He raced across the godswood, taking the long way around to avoid the pool where the heart tree grew. The heart tree had always frightened him, trees ought not of eyes, Bran thought, or leaves that looked like hands. His wolf came sprinting at his heels. You stay here, he told him at the base of the sentinel tree near the armory wall. Lie down. That's right. Now stay. The wolf did as he was told. Bran scratched him behind the ears, then turned away, jumped, grabbed a low branch, and pulled himself up. He was halfway up the tree, moving easily from limb to limb, when the wolf got to his feet and began to howl. Bran looked back down. His wolf fell silent, staring up at him through slitted yellow eyes. A strange chill went through him. He began to climb again. Once more the wolf howled. Quiet, he yelled. Sit down. Stay. You're worse than mother. The howling chased him all the way up the tree, until finally he jumped off onto the armory roof and out of sight. The rooftops of Winterfell were Bran's second home. His mother often said that Bran could climb before he could walk. 
Bran could not remember when he first learned to walk, but he could not remember when he started to climb either, so he supposed it must be true. To a boy, Winterfell was a grey stone labyrinth of walls and towers and courtyards and tunnels spreading out in all directions. In the older parts of the castle, the halls slanted up and down so that you couldn't even be sure what floor you were on. The place had grown over the centuries like some monstrous stone tree, Master Lewin told him once, and its branches were gnarled and thick and twisted, its roots sunk deep into the earth. When he got out from under it and scrambled up near the sky, Bran could see all of Winterfell in a glance. He liked the way it looked, spread out beneath him, only birds wheeling over his head while all the life of the castle went on below. Bran could perch for hours among the shapeless, rain-worn gargoyles that brooded over the first keep, watching it all, the men drilling with wood and steel in the yard, the cooks tending their vegetables in the glass garden, restless dogs running back and forth in the kennels, the silence of the godswood, the girls gossiping beside the washing well. It made him feel like he was lord of the castle, in a way even Rob would never know. It taught him Winterfell's secrets too. The builders had not even leveled the earth, there were hills and valleys behind the walls of Winterfell. There was a covered bridge that went from the fourth floor of the bell tower across to the second floor of the rookery. Bran knew about that. And he knew you could get inside the inner wall by the south gate, climb three floors and run all the way around Winterfell through a narrow tunnel in the stone, and then come out on ground level at the north gate with a hundred feet of wall looming over you. Even Master Lewin didn't know that, Bran was convinced. His mother was terrified that one day Bran would slip off a wall and kill himself. He told her that he wouldn't, but she never believed him. Once she made him promise that he would stay on the ground. He had managed to keep that promise for almost a fortnight, miserable every day until one night he had gone out the window of his bedroom when his brothers were fast asleep. He confessed his crime the next day in a fit of guilt. Lord Eden ordered him to the godswood to cleanse himself. Guards were posted to see that Bran remained there alone all night to reflect on his disobedience. The next morning Bran was nowhere to be seen. They finally found him fast asleep in the upper branches of the tallest sentinel in the grove. As angry as he was, his father could not help but laugh. You're not my son, he told Bran when they fetched him down, you're a squirrel. So be it. If you must climb, then climb, but try not to let your mother see you. Bran did his best, although he did not think he ever really fooled her. Since his father would not forbid it, she turned to others. Old Nan told him a story about a bad little boy who climbed too high and was struck down by lightning, and how afterward the crows came to peck out his eyes. Bran was not impressed. There were crows' nests atop the broken tower, where no one ever went but him, and sometimes he filled his pockets with corn before he climbed up there and the crows ate it right out of his hand. None of them had ever shown the slightest bit of interest in pecking out his eyes. Later, Master Lewin built a little pottery boy and dressed him in Bran's clothes and flung him off the wall into the yard below, to demonstrate what would happen to Bran if he fell. That had been fun, but afterward Bran just looked at the master and said, I'm not made of clay. And anyhow, I never fall. Then for a while the guards would chase him whenever they saw him on the roofs, and tried to haul him down. That was the best time of all. It was like playing a game with his brothers, except that Bran always won. None of the guards could climb half so well as Bran, not even Jory. Most of the time they never saw him anyway. People never looked up. That was another thing he liked about climbing, it was almost like being invisible. He liked how it felt too, pulling himself up a wall stone by stone, fingers and toes digging hard into the small crevices between. He always took off his boots and went barefoot when he climbed, it made him feel as if he had four hands instead of two. He liked the deep, sweet ache it left in the muscles afterward. He liked the way the air tasted way up high, sweet and cold as a winter beach. He liked the birds, the crows in the broken tower, 
the tiny little sparrows that nested in cracks between the stones, the ancient owl that slept in the dusty loft above the old armory. Bran knew them all. Most of all, he liked going places that no one else could go, and seeing the grey sprawl of Winterfell in a way that no one else ever saw it. It made the whole castle Bran's secret place. His favourite haunt was the Broken Tower. Once it had been a watchtower, the tallest in Winterfell. A long time ago, a hundred years before even his father had been born, a lightning strike had set it afire. The top third of the structure had collapsed inward, and the tower had never been rebuilt. Sometimes his father sent ratters into the base of the tower, to clean out the nests they always found among the jumble of fallen stones and charred and rotten beams. But no one ever got up to the jagged top of the structure now except for Bran and the crows. He knew two ways to get there. You could climb straight up the side of the tower itself, but the stones were loose, the mortar that held them together long gone to ash, and Bran never liked to put his full weight on them. The best way was to start from the godswood, chimney up the tall sentinel, and cross over the armory and the guard's hall, leaping roof to roof, barefoot so the guards wouldn't hear you overhead. That brought you up to the blind side of the first keep, the oldest part of the castle, a squat round fortress that was taller than it looked. Only rats and spiders lived there now but the old stones still made for good climbing. You could go straight up to where the gargoyles leaned out blindly over empty space, and swing from gargoyle to gargoyle, hand over hand, around to the north side. From there, if you really stretched, you could reach out and pull yourself over to the broken tower where it leaned close. The last part was the scramble up the blackened stones to the eerie, no more than ten feet, and then the crows would come round to see if you'd brought any corn. Bran was moving from gargoyle to gargoyle with the ease of long practice when he heard the voices. He was so startled he almost lost his grip. The first keep had been empty all his life. I do not like it, a woman was saying. There was a row of windows beneath him, and the voice was drifting out of the last window on this side. You should be the hand. Gods forbid, a man's voice replied lazily. It's not an on-ride want. There's far too much work involved. Bran hung, listening, suddenly afraid to go on. They might glimpse his feet if he tried to swing by. Don't you see the danger this puts us in? The woman said. Robert loves the man like a brother. Robert can barely stomach his brothers. Not that I blame him. Stannis would be enough to give anyone indigestion. Don't play the fool. Stannis and Runley are one thing, and Eddard Stark is quite another. Robert will listen to Stark. Damn them both. I should have insisted that he name you, but I was certain Stark would refuse him. We ought to count ourselves fortunate, the man said. The king might as easily have named one of his brothers, or even Littlefinger. Gods help us. Give me honorable enemies rather than ambitious ones, and I'll sleep more easily by night. They were talking about father, Bran realized. He wanted to hear more. A few more feet. Dot. But they would see him if he swung out in front of the window. We will have to watch him carefully. The woman said. I would sooner watch you, the man said. He sounded bored. Come back here. Lord Eddard has never taken any interest in anything that happened south of the neck, the woman said. Never. I tell you, he means to move against us. Why else would he leave the seat of his power? A hundred reasons. Duty. Honor. He yearns to write his name large across the book of history to get away from his wife, or both. Perhaps he just wants to be warm for once in his life. His wife is Lady Aaron's sister. It's a wonder Lisa was not here to greet us with her accusations. Bran looked down. There was a narrow ledge beneath the window, only a few inches wide. He tried to lower himself toward it. Too far. He would never reach. You fret too much. Lisa Aaron is a frightened cow. That frightened cow shared John Rin's bed. If she knew anything, she would have gone to Robert before she fled King's Landing. 
when he had already agreed to foster that weakling son of hers at Casterly Rock. I think not. She knew the boy's life would be hostage to her silence. She may grow bolder now that he's safe atop the eerie. Mothers. The man made the word sound like a curse. I think birthing does something to your minds. You are all mad. He laughed. It was a bitter sound. Let Lady Erin grow as bold as she likes. Whatever she knows, whatever she thinks she knows, she has no proof. He paused a moment. Or does she? Do you think the king will require proof? The woman said. I tell you, he loves me not. And whose fault is that, sweet sister? Bran studied the ledge. He could drop down. It was too narrow to land on, but if he could catch hold as he fell past, pull himself up. Dot. Except that might make a noise, draw them to the window. He was not sure what he was hearing, but he knew it was not meant for his ears. You are as blind as Robert, the woman was saying. If you mean I see the same thing, yes, the man said. I see a man who would sooner die than betray his king. He betrayed one already, or have you forgotten? The woman said. Oh, I don't deny he's loyal to Robert, that's obvious. What happens when Robert dies and Joff takes the throne? And the sooner that comes to pass, the safer we'll all be. My husband grows more restless every day. Having Stark beside him will only make him worse. He's still in love with the sister, the insipid little dead sixteen-year-old. How long till he decides to put me aside for some new liner? Bran was suddenly very frightened. He wanted nothing so much as to go back the way he had come, to find his brothers. Only what would he tell them? He had to get closer, Bran realized. He had to see who was talking. The man sighed. You should think less about the future and more about the pleasures at hand. Stop that. The woman said. Bran heard the sudden slap of flesh on flesh, then the man's laughter. Bran pulled himself up, climbed over the gargoyle crawled out onto the roof. This was the easy way. He moved across the roof to the next gargoyle, right above the window of the room where they were talking. All this talk is getting very tiresome, sister, the man said. Come here and be quiet. Bran sat astride the gargoyle, tightened his legs around it, and swung himself around, upside down. He hung by his legs and slowly stretched his head down toward the window. The world looked strange upside down. A courtyard swam dizzily below him, its stones still wet with melted snow. Bran looked in the window. Inside the room, a man and a woman were wrestling. They were both naked. Bran could not tell who they were. The man's back was to him, and his body screened the woman from view as he pushed her up against a wall. There were soft, wet sounds. Bran realized they were kissing. He watched, wide-eyed and frightened, his breath tight in his throat. The man had a hand down between her legs, and he must have been hurting her there, because the woman started to moan, low in her throat. Stop it, she said, stop it, stop it. Oh, please. Dot. But her voice was low and weak, and she did not push him away. Her hands buried themselves in his hair his tangled golden hair, and pulled his face down to her breast. Bran saw her face. Her eyes were closed and her mouth was open, moaning. Her golden hair swung from side to side as her head moved back and forth, but still he recognized the queen. He must have made a noise. Suddenly her eyes opened, and she was staring right at him. She screamed. Everything happened at once then. Apostrophe the woman pushed the man away wildly, shouting and pointing. Bran tried to pull himself up, bending double as he reached for the gargoyle. He was in too much of a hurry. His hand scraped uselessly across smooth stone, and in his panic his legs slipped, and suddenly he was failing. There was an instant of vertigo, a sickening lurch as the window flashed past. He shot out a hand, grabbed for the ledge, lost it caught it again with his other hand. He swung against the building, hard. The impact took the breath out of him. Bran dangled, 
one-handed, panting. Faces appeared in the window above him. The queen. And now Bran recognized the man beside her. They looked as much alike as reflections in a mirror. He saw us, the woman said shrilly. So he did, the man said. Bran's fingers started to slip. He grabbed the ledge with his other hand. Fingernails dug into unyielding stone. The man reached down. Take my hand, he said. Before you fall. Bran seized his arm and held on tight with all his strength. The man yanked him up to the ledge. What are you doing? The woman demanded. The man ignored her. He was very strong. He stood Bran up on the sill. How old are you, boy? Seven, Bran said, shaking with relief. His fingers had dug deep gouges in the man's forearm. He let go sheepishly. The man looked over at the woman. The things I do for love, he said with loathing. He gave Bran a shove. Screaming, Bran went backward out the window into empty air. There was nothing to grab onto. The courtyard rushed up to meet him. Somewhere off in the distance, a wolf was howling. Crows circled the broken tower, waiting for corn. Tyrion. Somewhere in the great stone maze of Winterfell, a wolf howled. The sound hung over the castle like a flag of mourning. Tyrion Lannister looked up from his books and shivered, though the library was snug and warm. Something about the howling of a wolf took a man right out of his here and now and left him in a dark forest of the mind, running naked before the pack. When the dire wolf howled again, Tyrion shut the heavy leather-bound cover on the book he was reading, a hundred-year-old discourse on the changing of the seasons by a long-dead master. He covered a yawn with the back of his hand. His reading lamp was flickering, its oil all but gone, as dawn light leaked through the high windows. He had been at it all night, but that was nothing new. Tyrion Lannister was not much a one for sleeping. His legs were stiff and sore as he eased down off the bench. He massaged some life back into them and limped heavily to the table where the septon was snoring softly, his head pillowed on an open book in front of him. Tyrion glanced at the title. A Life of the Grand Mester Ethel Muir, no wonder. Chael, he said softly. The young man jerked up, blinking, confused, the crystal of his order swinging wildly on its silver chain. I'm off to break my fast. See that you return the books to the shelves. Be gentle with the Valyrian scrolls. The parchment is very dry. Emmerdon's Engines of War is quite rare, and yours is the only complete copy I've ever seen. Chael gaped at him, still half asleep. Patiently, Tyrion repeated his instructions, then clapped the septon on the shoulder and left him to his tasks. Outside, Tyrion swallowed a lungful of the cold morning air and began his laborious descent of the steep stone steps that corkscrewed around the exterior of the library tower. It was slow going. The steps were cut high and narrow, while his legs were short and twisted. The rising sun had not yet cleared the walls of Winterfell, but the men were already hard at it in the yard below. Sander Clegane's rasping voice drifted up to him. The boy is a long time dying. I wish he would be quicker about it. Tyrion glanced down and saw the hound standing with young Joffrey as squires swarmed around them. At least he dies quietly, the prince replied. It's the wolf that makes the noise. I could scarce sleep last night. Clegane cast a long shadow across the hard-packed earth as his squire lowered the black helm over his head. I could silence the creature, if it please you, he said through his open visor. His boy placed a long sword in his hand. He tested the weight of it, slicing at the cold morning air. Behind him, the yard rang to the clangor of steel on steel. The notion seemed to delight the prince. Send a dog to kill a dog he exclaimed. Winterfell is so infested with wolves, the Starks would never miss one. Tyrion hopped off the last step onto the yard. I beg to differ, nephew, he said. The Starks can count past six. Unlike some princes I might name. Joffrey had the grace at least to blush. A voice from nowhere, Sander said. He peered through his helm, looking this way and that. 
spirits of the air. The prince laughed, as he always laughed when his bodyguard did this mama's fuss. Tyrion was used to it. Down here. The tall man peered down at the ground, and pretended to notice him. The little Lord Tyrion, he said. My pardons. I did not see you standing there. I am in no mood for your insolence today. Tyrion turned to his nephew. Joffrey, it is past time you called on Lord Eddard and his lady, to offer them your comfort. Joffrey looked as petulant as only a boy prince can look. What good will my comfort do them? None, Tyrion said. Yet it is expected of you. Your absence has been noted. The Stark boy is nothing to me, Joffrey said. I cannot abide the wailing of women. Tyrion Lannister reached up and slapped his nephew hard across the face. The boy's cheek began to redden. One word, Tyrion said, and I will hit you again. I'm going to tell mother. Joffrey exclaimed. Tyrion hit him again. Now both cheeks flamed. You tell your mother, Tyrion told him. But first you get yourself to Lord and Lady Stark, and you fall to your knees in front of them, and you tell them how very sorry you are, and that you are at their service if there is the slightest thing you can do for them or theirs in this desperate hour, and that all your prayers go with them. Do you understand? Do you? The boy looked as though he was going to cry. Instead, he managed a weak nod. Then he turned and fled headlong from the yard, holding his cheek. Tyrion watched him run. A shadow fell across his face. He turned to find Clegane looming overhead like a cliff. His soot dark armor seemed to blot out the sun. He had lowered the visor on his helm. It was fashioned in the likeness of a snarling black hound, fearsome to behold, but Tyrion had always thought it a great improvement over Clegane's hideously burned face. The prince will remember that, little lord. The hound warned him. The helm turned his laugh into a hollow rumble. I pray he does, Tyrion Lannister replied. If he forgets, be a good dog and remind him. He glanced around the courtyard. Do you know where I might find my brother? Breaking fast with the queen? Ah, Tyrion said. He gave Sander Clegane a perfunctory nod and walked away as briskly as his stunted legs would carry him, whistling. He pitied the first knight to try the hound today. The man did have a temper. A cold, cheerless meal had been laid out in the morning room of the guest house. Jaime sat at table with Circe and the children, talking in low, hushed voices. Is Robert still abed? Tyrion asked as he seated himself, uninvited, at the table. His sister peered at him with the same expression of faint distaste she had worn since the day he was born. The king has not slept at all, she told him. He is with Lord Eddard. He has taken their sorrow deeply to heart. He has a large heart, our Robert, Jaime said with a lazy smile. There was very little that Jaime took seriously. Tyrion knew that about his brother, and forgave it. During all the terrible long years of his childhood, only Jaime had ever shown him the smallest measure of affection or respect, and for that Tyrion was willing to forgive him most anything. A servant approached. Bread, Tyrion told him, and two of those little fish, and a mug of that good dark beer to wash them down. Oh, and some bacon. Burn it until it turns black. The man bowed and moved off. Tyrion turned back to his siblings twins, male and female. They looked very much the part this morning. Both had chosen a deep green that matched their eyes. Their blonde curls were all a fashionable tumble, and gold ornaments shone at wrists and fingers and throats. Tyrion wondered what it would be like to have a twin, and decided that he would rather not know. Bad enough to face himself in a looking glass every day. Another him was a thought too dreadful to contemplate. Prince Tommen spoke up. Do you have news of Bran, uncle? I stopped by the sick room last night, Tyrion announced. There was no change. The master thought that a hopeful sign. I don't want Brandon to die, Tommen said timorously. He was a sweet boy. Not like his brother, but then Jaime and Tyrion were somewhat less than peas in a pod themselves. 
Lord Eddard had a brother named Brandon as well, Jaime mused. One of the hostages murdered by Targaryen. It seems to be an unlucky name. Oh, not so unlucky as all that, surely, Dirian said. The servant brought his plate. He ripped off a chunk of black bread. Cersei was studying him warily. What do you mean? Tyrion gave her a crooked smile. Why, only that Tommen may get his wish. The master thinks the boy may yet live. He took a sip of beer. Miss Ella gave a happy gasp, and Tommen smiled nervously, but it was not the children Tyrion was watching. The glance that passed between Jaime and Cersei lasted no more than a second, but he did not miss it. Then his sister dropped her gaze to the table. That is no mercy. These northern gods are cruel to let the child linger in such pain. What were the master's words? Jaime asked. The bacon crunched when he bit into it. Tyrion chewed thoughtfully for a moment and said, he thinks that if the boy were going to die, he would have done so already. It has been four days with no change. Will Bran get better, uncle? Little Miss Ello asked. She had all of her mother's beauty, and none of her nature. His back is broken, little one, Tyrion told her. The fall shattered his legs as well. They keep him alive with honey and water, or he would starve to death. Perhaps, if he wakes, he will be able to eat real food, but he will never walk again. If he wakes, Cersei repeated. Is that likely? The gods alone know, Tyrion told her. The master only hopes. He chewed some more bread. I would swear that wolf of his is keeping the boy alive. The creature is outside his window day and night, howling. Every time they chase it away, it returns. The master said they closed the window once, to shut out the noise, and Bran seemed to weaken. When they opened it again, his heart beat stronger. The queen shuddered. There is something unnatural about those animals, she said. They are dangerous. I will not have any of them coming south with us. Jaime said, you'll have a hard time stopping them, sister. They follow those girls everywhere. Tyrion started on his fish. Are you leaving soon, then? Not near soon enough, Cersei said. Then she frowned. Are we leaving? She echoed. What about you? Gods, don't tell me you are staying here? Tyrion shrugged. Benjamin Stark is returning to the Night's Watch with his brother's bastard. I have a mind to go with them and see this wall we have all heard so much of. Jaime smiled. I hope you're not thinking of taking the black on us, sweet brother. Tyrion laughed. What, me, celibate? The whores would go begging from dawn to Casterly Rock. No. I just want to stand on top of the wall and piss off the edge of the world. Cersei stood abruptly. The children don't need to hear this filth. Tommen, Miss Ella, come. She strode briskly from the morning room, her train and her pups trailing behind her. Jaime Lannister regarded his brother thoughtfully with those cool green eyes. Stark will never consent to leave Winterfell with his son lingering in the shadow of death. He will if Robert commands it, Tyrion said. And Robert will command it. There is nothing Lord Eddard can do for the boy in any case. He could end his torment, Jaime said. I would, if it were my son. It would be a mercy. I advise against putting that suggestion to Lord Eddard, sweet brother, Tyrion said. He would not take it kindly. Even if the boy does live, he will be a cripple. Worse than a cripple. A grotesque. Give me a good clean death. Tyrion replied with a shrug that accentuated the twist of his shoulders. Speaking for the grotesques, he said, I beg to differ. Death is so terribly final, while life is full of possibilities. Jaime smiled. You are a perverse little imp, aren't you? Oh, yes, Tyrion admitted. I hope the boy does wake. I would be most interested to hear what he might have to say. His brother's smile curdled like sour milk. Tyrion, my sweet brother, he said darkly, there are times when you give me cause to wonder whose side you are on. Tyrion's mouth was full of bread and fish. He took a swallow of strong black beer to wash it all down, 
and grinned up wolfishly at Jaime, why, Jaime, my sweet brother, he said, you wound me. You know how much I love my family. John. John climbed the steps slowly, trying not to think that this might be the last time ever. Ghost padded silently beside him. Outside, snow swirled through the castle gates, and the yard was all noise and chaos, but inside the thick stone walls it was still warm and quiet. Too quiet for John's liking. He reached the landing and stood for a long moment, afraid. Ghost nuzzled at his hand. He took courage from that. He straightened, and entered the room. Lady Stark was there beside his bed. She had been there, day and night, for close on a fortnight. Not for a moment had she left Bran's side. She had her meals brought to her there, and chamber pots as well, and a small hard bed to sleep on, though it was said she had scarcely slept at all. She fed him herself, the honey and water and herb mixture that sustained life. Not once did she leave the room. So John had stayed away. But now there was no more time. He stood in the door for a moment, afraid to speak, afraid to come closer. The window was open. Below, a wolf howled. Ghost heard and lifted his head. Lady Stark looked over. For a moment she did not seem to recognize him. Finally she blinked. What are you doing here? she asked in a voice strangely flat and emotionless. I came to see Bran, John said. To say goodbye. Her face did not change. Her long auburn hair was dull and tangled. She looked as though she had aged twenty years. You've said it. Now go away. Part of him wanted only to flee, but he knew that if he did he might never see Bran again. He took a nervous step into the room. Please, he said. Something cold moved in her eyes. I told you to leave, she said. We don't want you here. Once that would have sent him running. Once that might even have made him cry. Now it only made him angry. He would be a sworn brother of the Night's Watch soon, and face worse dangers than Catelyn Tully Stark. He's my brother, he said. Shall I call the guards? Call them, John said, defiant. You can't stop me from seeing him. He crossed the room, keeping the bed between them, and looked down on Bran where he lay. She was holding one of his hands. It looked like a claw. This was not the Bran he remembered. The flesh had all gone from him. His skin stretched tight over bones like sticks. Under the blanket, his legs bent in ways that made John sick. His eyes were sunken deep into black pits, open, but they saw nothing. The fall had shrunken him somehow. He looked half a leaf, as if the first strong wind would carry him off to his grave. Yet under the frail cage of those shattered ribs, his chest rose and fell with each low breath. Bran, he said, I'm sorry I didn't come before. I was afraid. He could feel the tears rolling down his cheeks. John no longer cared. Don't die, Bran. Please. We're all waiting for you to wake up. Me and Robin the girls, everyone. Dot. Lady Stark was watching. She had not raised a cry. John took that for acceptance. Outside the window, the dire wolf howled again. The wolf that Bran had not had time to name. I have to go now, John said. Uncle Benjamin is waiting. I'm to go north to the wall. We have to leave today, before the snows come. He remembered how excited Bran had been at the prospect of the journey. It was more than he could bear, the thought of leaving him behind like this. John brushed away his tears, leaned over, and kissed his brother lightly on their lips. I wanted him to stay here with me, Lady Stark said softly. John watched her, wary. She was not even looking at him. She was talking to him but for a part of her, it was as though he were not even in the room. I prayed for it, she said dully. He was my special boy. I went to the sept and prayed seven times to the seven faces of God that Ned would change his mind and leave him here with me. Sometimes prayers are answered. John did not know what to say. It wasn't your fault. He managed after an awkward silence. 
Her eyes found him. They were full of poison. I need none of your absolution, bastard. John lowered his eyes. She was cradling one of Bran's hands. He took the other, squeezed it. Fingers like the bones of birds. Goodbye, he said. He was at the door when she called out to him. John, she said. He should have kept going, but she had never called him by his name before. He turned to find her looking at his face, as if she were seeing it for the first time. Yes, he said. It should have been you, she told him. Then she turned back to Bran and began to weep, her whole body shaking with the sobs. John had never seen her cry before. It was a long walk down to the yard. Outside, everything was noise and confusion. Wagons were being loaded, men were shouting, horses were being harnessed and saddled and led from the stables. A light snow had begun to fall, and everyone was in an uproar to be off. Rob was in the middle of it, shouting commands with the best of them. He seemed to have grown of late, as if Bran's fall and his mother's collapse had somehow made him stronger. Grey Wind was at his side. Uncle Benjamin is looking for you, he told John. He wanted to be gone an hour ago. I know, John said. Soon? He looked around at all the noise and confusion. Leaving is harder than I thought. For me too, Rob said. He had snow in his hair, melting from the heat of his body. Did you see him? John nodded, not trusting himself to speak. He's not going to die, Rob said. I know it. You Starks are hard to kill, John agreed. His voice was flat and tired. The visit had taken all the strength from him. Rob knew something was wrong. My mother. Dot. She was. Dot. Very kind, John told him. Rob looked relieved. Good. He smiled. The next time I see you, you'll be all in black. John forced himself to smile back. It was always my color. How long do you think it will be? Soon enough, Rob promised. He pulled John to him and embraced him fiercely. Farewell, Snow. John hugged him back. And you, Stark. Take care of Bran. I will. They broke apart and looked at each other awkwardly. Uncle Benjamin said to send you to the stables if I saw you, Rob finally said. I have one more farewell to make, John told him. Then I haven't seen you, Rob replied. John left him standing there in the snow, surrounded by wagons and wolves and horses. It was a short walk to the armory. He picked up his package and took the covered bridge across to the keep. Aria was in her room, packing a polished ironwood chest that was bigger than she was. Nymeria was helping. Aria would only have to point, and the wolf would bound across the room, snatch up some wisp of silk in her jaws, and fetch it back. But when she smelled ghost, she sat down on her haunches and yelped at them. Aria glanced behind her, saw John, and jumped to her feet. She threw her skinny arms tight around his neck. I was afraid you were gone, she said, her breath catching in her throat. They wouldn't let me out to say goodbye. What did you do now? John was amused. Aria disentangled herself from him and made a face. Nothing. I was all packed and everything. She gestured at the huge chest, no more than a third full, and at the clothes that were scattered all over the room. Septim Ordain says I have to do it all over. My things weren't properly folded, she says. A proper Southron lady doesn't just throw her clothes inside her chest like old rags, she says. Is that what you did, little sister? Well, they're going to get all messed up anyway she said. Who cares how they're folded? Septim Ordain, John told her. I don't think she'd like Nymeria helping, either. The she-wolf regarded him silently with her dark golden eyes. It's just as well. I have something for you to take with you, and it has to be packed very carefully. Her face lit up. A present. You could call it that. Close the door. Wary but excited, Aria checked the hall. Nymeria, here. Guard. She left the wolf out there to warn of intruders and closed the door. 
By then John had pulled off the rags he'd wrapped it in. He held it out to her. Aria's eyes went wide. Dark eyes, like his. A sword, she said in a small, hushed breath. The scabbard was soft grey leather, supple as sin. John drew out the blade slowly, so she could see the deep blue sheen of the steel. This is no toy, he told her. Be careful you don't cut yourself. The edges are sharp enough to shave with. Girls don't shave, Arius said. Maybe they should. Have you ever seen the scepter's legs? She giggled at him. It's so skinny. So are you, John told her. I had Mick and make this special. The Bravos use swords like this in Pentos and Mir and the other free cities. It won't hack a man's head off, but it can poke him full of holes if you're fast enough. I can be fast, Arius said. You'll have to work at it every day. He put the sword in her hands, showed her how to hold it, and stepped back. How does it feel? Do you like the balance? I think so, Arius said. First lesson, John said. Stick them with the pointy end. Aria gave him a whap on the arm with the flat of her blade. The blow stung, but John found himself grinning like an idiot. I know which end to use, Aria said. A doubtful look crossed her face. Septa Mordain will take it away from me. Not if she doesn't know you have it, John said. Who will I practice with? You'll find someone, John promised her. King's Landing is a true city a thousand times the size of Winterfell. Until you find a partner, watch how they fight in the yard. Run, and ride, make yourself strong. And whatever you do. Dot. Arya knew what was coming next. They said it together. Dot. Don't. Dot. Tell. Dot. Sansa. John messed up her hair. I will miss you, little sister. Suddenly she looked like she was going to cry. I wish you were coming with us. Different roads sometimes lead to the same castle. Who knows? He was feeling better now. He was not going to let himself be sad. I better go. I'll spend my first year on the wall emptying chamber pots if I keep Uncle Ben waiting any longer. Aria ran to him for a last hug. Put down the sword first, John warned her laughing. She set it aside almost shyly and showered him with kisses. When he turned back at the door, she was holding it again, trying it for balance. I almost forgot, he told her. All the best swords have names. Like ice, she said. She looked at the blade in her hand. Does this have a name? Oh, tell me. Can't you guess? John teased. Your very favorite thing. Aria seemed puzzled at first. Then it came to her. She was that quick. They said it together, Needle. The memory of her laughter warmed him on the long ride north. Daenerys. Daenerys Targaryen wed Kildrogo with fear and barbaric splendor in a field beyond the walls of Pentos, for the Dothraki believed that all things of importance in a man's life must be done beneath the open sky. Drogo had called his Kalazar to attend him and they had come, 40,000 Dothraki warriors and uncounted numbers of women, children, and slaves. Outside the city walls they camped with their vast herds, raising palaces of woven grass, eating everything in sight, and making the good folk of Pentos more anxious with every passing day. My fellow magisters have doubled the size of the city guard. Illyrio told them over platters of honey duck and orange snap peppers one night at the manse that had been Drogo's. The Kli had joined his Kalazar, his estate given over to Daenerys and her brother until the wedding. Best we get Princess Daenerys wedded quickly before they hand half the wealth of Bentos away to Selzords and Bravos, Sir Jerome Ormond jested. The exile had offered her brother his sword the night Danny had been sold to Kbul Drogo. Visories had accepted eagerly. Mormont had been their constant companion ever since. Magister Illyrio laughed lightly through his forked beard, but Visories did not so much as smile. He can have her tomorrow, if he likes, her brother said. He glanced over at Danny, and she lowered her eyes. So long as he pays the price. 
Illyrio waved a languid hand in the air, rings glittering on his fat fingers. I have told you, all is settled. Trust me. The Kli has promised you a crown, and you shall have it. Yes, but when? When the Kli chooses, Illyrio said. He will have the girl first, and after they are wed he must make his procession across the plains and present her to the Dosh Kaelin of Zdothrak. After that, perhaps. If the omens favor war. Visor is seethed with impatience. I piss on Dothraki omens. The usurper sits on my father's throne. How long must I wait? Illyrio gave a massive shrug. You have waited most of your life, great king. What is another few months, another few years? Sergera, who had traveled as far east as Vzdothrak, nodded in agreement. I counsel you to be patient, your grace. The Dothraki are true to their word, but they do things in their own time. A lesser man may beg a favor from the Kl, but must never presume to berate him. Visories bristled. Guard your tongue, Mormont, or I'll have it out. I am no lesser man. I am the rightful lord of the seven kingdoms. The dragon does not beg. Sergera lowered his eyes respectfully. Illyrio smiled enigmatically and tore a wing from the duck. Honey and grease ran over his fingers and dripped down into his beard as he nibbled at the tender meat. There are no more dragons, Danny thought, staring at her brother, though she did not dare say it aloud. Yet that night she dreamt of one. Visories was hitting her hurting her. She was naked, clumsy with fear. She ran from him, but her body seemed thick and ungainly. He struck her again. She stumbled and fell. You woke the dragon, he screamed as he kicked her. You woke the dragon, you woke the dragon. Her thighs were slick with blood. She closed her eyes and whimpered. As if in answer, there was a hideous ripping sound and the crackling of some great fire. When she looked again, Visories was gone, great columns of flame rose all around, and in the midst of them was the dragon. It turned its great head slowly. When its molten eyes found hers, she woke, shaking and covered with a fine sheen of sweat. She had never been so afraid. Dot. Until the day of her wedding came at last. The ceremony began at dawn and continued until dusk, an endless day of drinking and feasting and fighting. A mighty earthen ramp had been raised amid the grass palaces, and the Dani was seated beside Kildrogo, above the seething sea of Dothraki. She had never seen so many people in one place, nor people so strange and frightening. The horse lords might put on rich fabrics and sweet perfumes when they visited the free cities, but out under the open sky they kept the old ways. Men and women alike wore painted leather vests over bare chests and horsehair leggings cinched by bronze medallion belts, and the warriors greased their long braids with fat from the rendering pits. They gorged themselves on horse flesh roasted with honey and peppers, drank themselves blind on fermented mare's milk and Delirio's fine wines, and spat jests at each other across the fires, their voices harsh and alien in Danny's ears. Visories was seated just below her, splendid in a new black wool tunic with a scarlet dragon on the chest. Illyrio and Sergera sat beside him. Theirs was a place of high honor, just below the Kilzone blood riders, but Danny could see the anger in her brother's lilac eyes. He did not like sitting beneath her, and he fumed when the slaves offered each dish first to the clint his bride, and served him from the portions they refused. He could do nothing but nurse his resentment, so nurse it he did, his mood growing blacker by the hour at each insult to his person. Danny had never felt so alone as she did seated in the midst of that vast horde. Her brother had told her to smile, and so she smiled until her face ached and the tears came unbidden to her eyes. She did her best to hide them, knowing how angry Visories would be if he saw her crying, terrified of how Kildrogo might react. Food was brought to her, steaming joints of meat and thick black sausages and Dothraki blood pies, and later fruits and sweet grass stews and delicate pastries from the kitchens of Pentos, but she waved it all away. Her stomach was a royal, and she knew she could keep none of it down. There was no one to talk to. 
Kaldrogo shouted commands and jests down to his blood riders, and laughed at their replies, but he scarcely glanced at Danny beside him. They had no common language. Dothraki was incomprehensible to her, and the clan knew only a few words of the bastard Valerian of the Free Cities, and none at all of the common tongue of the Seven Kingdoms. She would even have welcomed the conversation of Illyrio and her brother, but they were too far below to hear her. So she sat in her wedding silks, nursing a cup of honey wine, afraid to eat, talking silently to herself. I am blood of the dragon, she told herself. I am Daenerys Stormborn, princess of Dragonstone, of the blood and seed of Aegon the Conqueror. The sun was only a quarter of the way up the sky when she saw her first man die. Drums were beating as some of the women danced for the cl. Drogo watched without expression, but his eyes followed their movements, and from time to time he would toss down a bronze medallion for the women to fight over. Their warriors were watching too. One of them finally stepped into the circle, grabbed a dancer by the arm, pushed her down to the ground, and mounted her right there, as a stallion mounts a mare. Illyrio had told her that might happen. The Dothraki made like the animals in their herds. There is no privacy in Akaleza, and they do not understand sin or shame as we do. Danny looked away from the coupling, frightened when she realized what was happening, but a second warrior stepped forward, and a third, and soon there was no way to avert her eyes. Then two men seized the same woman. She heard a shout, saw a shove, and in the blink of an eye the arax were out long razor-sharp blades, half-sword and half-scythe. A dance of death began as the warriors circled and slashed, leaping toward each other, whirling the blades around their heads, shrieking insults at each clash. No one made a move to interfere. It ended as quickly as it began. The arax shivered together faster than Danny could follow. One man missed a step, the other swung his blade in a flat arc. Steel bit into flesh just above the Dothraki's waist, and opened him from backbone to belly button, spilling his entrails into the dust. As the loser died, the winner took hold of the nearest woman, not even the one they had been quarreling over, and had her there and then. Slaves carried off the body, and the dancing resumed. Magister Illyrio had warned Danny about this too. A Dothraki wedding without at least three deaths is deemed a dull affair, he had said. Her wedding must have been especially blessed, before the day was over, a dozen men had died. As the hours passed, the terror grew in Danny, until it was all she could do not to scream. She was afraid of the Dothraki, whose ways seemed alien and monstrous, as if they were beasts in human skins and not true men at all. She was afraid of her brother, of what he might do if she failed him. Most of all, she was afraid of what would happen tonight under the stars, when her brother gave her up to the hulking giant who sat drinking beside her with a face as still and cruel as a bronze mask. I am the blood of the dragon, she told herself again. When at last the sun was low in the sky, Kulrogo clapped his hands together, and the drums and the shouting and feasting came to a sudden halt. Drogo stood and pulled Danny to her feet beside him. It was time for her bride gifts. And after the gifts, she knew, after the sun had gone down, it would be time for the first tried and the consummation of her marriage. Danny tried to put the thought aside, but it would not leave her. She hugged herself to try to keep from shaking. Her brother Viserys gifted her with three handmaids. Danny knew they had cost him nothing. Illyrio no doubt had provided the girls. Iri and Jiki were copper-skinned Dothraki with black hair and almond-shaped eyes, Doria a fair-haired, blue-eyed Lysine girl. These are no common servants, sweet sister, her brother told her as they were brought forward one by one. Illyrio and I selected them personally for you. Iri will teach you riding, Jiki the Dothraki tongue and Doria will instruct you in the womanly arts of love. He smiled thinly. She's very good, Illyrio and I can both swear to that. Sir Jerome Ormont apologized for his gift. It is a small thing, my princess, but all a poor exile could afford, 
he said as he laid a small stack of old books before her. They were histories and songs of the seven kingdoms, she saw, written in the common tongue. She thanked him with all her heart. Magister Illyrio murmured a command, and four burly slaves hurried forward, bearing between them a great cedar chest bound in bronze. When she opened it, she found piles of the finest velvets and damasks the free cities could produce. Dot. And resting on top, nestled in the soft cloth, three huge eggs. Danny gasped. They were the most beautiful things she had ever seen, each different than the others, patterned in such rich colors that at first she thought they were crusted with jewels, and so large it took both of her hands to hold one. She lifted it delicately, expecting that it would be made of some fine porcelain or delicate enamel, or even blown glass, but it was much heavier than that, as if it were all of solid stone. The surface of the shell was covered with tiny scales, and as she turned the egg between her fingers, they shimmered like polished metal in the light of the setting sun. One egg was a deep green, with burnished bronze flecks that came and went depending on how Danny turned it. Another was pale cream streaked with gold. The last was black, as black as a midnight sea, yet alive with scarlet ripples and swirls. What are they? she asked, her voice hushed and full of wonder. Dragon's eggs, from the shadow lands beyond a high, said Magister Illyrio. The Eons have turned them to stone, yet still they burn bright with beauty. I shall treasure them always. Danny had heard tales of such eggs, but she had never seen one, nor thought to see one. It was a truly magnificent gift, though she knew that Illyrio could afford to be lavish. He had collected a fortune in horses and slaves for his part in selling her to Kldrogo. The Kl's blood riders offered her the traditional three weapons, and splendid weapons they were. Hago gave her a great leather whip with a silver handle. Kihilo a magnificent Arak chased in gold, and Koto a double curved dragon bone bow taller than she was. Magister Illyrio and Sergio had taught her the traditional refusals for these offerings. This is a gift worthy of a great warrior, O oh blood of my blood, and I am but a woman. Let my lord husband bear these in my stead. And so Kaldrogo too received his bride gifts. Other gifts she was given in plenty by other Dothraki slippers and jewels and silver rings for her hair, medallion belts and painted vests and soft furs, sand silks and jars of scent, needles and feathers and tiny bottles of purple glass, and a gown made from the skin of a thousand mice. A handsome gift, Kalisi, Magister Illyrio said of the last, after he had told her what it was. Most lucky. The gifts mounted up around her in great piles, more gifts than she could possibly imagine, more gifts than she could want or use. And last of all, Kaldrogo brought forth his own bride gift to her. An expectant hush rippled out from the center of the camp as he left her side, growing until it had swallowed the whole Kaleza. When he returned, the dense press of Dothraki gift givers parted before him, and he led the horse to her. She was a young filly, spirited and splendid. Danny knew just enough about horses to know that this was no ordinary animal. There was something about her that took the breath away. She was grey as the winter sea, with a mane like silver smoke. Hesitantly she reached out and stroked the horse's neck, ran her fingers through the silver of her mane. Kalrogo said something in Dothraki and Magister Illyrio translated. Silver for the silver of your hair, the Kl says. She's beautiful, Danny murmured. She is the pride of the Kaleza, Illyrio said. Custom decrees that the Kalesi must ride a mount worthy of her place by the side of the Kl. Drogo stepped forward and put his hands on her waist. He lifted her up as easily as if she were a child and set her on the thin Dothraki saddle, so much smaller than the ones she was used to. Danny sat there uncertain for a moment. No one had told her about this part. What should I do? she asked Illyrio. It was Sergio Mormont who answered. Take the reins and ride. You need not go far. Nervously Danny gathered the reins in her hands and slid her feet into the short stirrups. She was only a fair rider, 
she had spent far more time traveling by ship and wagon and palanquin than by horseback. Praying that she would not fall off and disgrace herself, she gave the filly the lightest and most timid touch with her knees. And for the first time in hours, she forgot to be afraid. Or perhaps it was for the first time ever. The silver gray filly moved with a smooth and silken gait, and the crowd parted for her, every eye upon them. Danny found herself moving faster than she had intended, yet somehow it was exciting rather than terrifying. The horse broke into a trot, and she smiled. Dothraki scrambled to clear a path. The slightest pressure with her legs, the lightest touch on the reins, and the filly responded. She sent it into a gallop, and now the Dothraki were hooting and laughing and shouting at her as they jumped out of her way. As she turned to ride back, a fire pit loomed ahead, directly in her path. They were hemmed in on either side, with no room to stop. A daring she had never known filled Daenerys then, and she gave the filly her head. The silver horse leapt the flames as if she had wings. When she pulled up before Magister Illyrio, she said, Tell Kildrogo that he has given me the wind. The fat Pentoshi stroked his yellow beard as he repeated her words in Dothraki, and Danny saw her new husband smile for the first time. The last sliver of sun vanished behind the high walls of Pentos to the west just then. Danny had lost all track of time. Kilrogo commanded his blood riders to bring forth his own horse, a lean red stallion. As the Kl was saddling the horse, Visory slid close to Danny on her silver, dug his fingers into her leg, and said, Please him, sweet sister, or I swear, you will see the dragon wake as it has never woken before. The fear came back to her then, with her brother's words. She felt like a child once more, only thirteen and all alone, not ready for what was about to happen to her. They rode out together as the stars came out, leaving the Kalazar and the grass palaces behind. Kilrogo spoke no word to her, but drove his stallion at a hard trot through the gathering dusk. The tiny silver bells in his long braid rang softly as he rode. I am the blood of the dragon, she whispered aloud as she followed, trying to keep her courage up. I am the blood of the dragon. I am the blood of the dragon. The dragon was never afraid. Afterward she could not say how far or how long they had ridden, but it was full dark when they stopped at a grassy place beside a small stream. Drogo swung off his horse and lifted her down from hers. She felt as fragile as glass in his hands her limbs as weak as water. She stood there helpless and trembling in her wedding silks while he secured the horses, and when he turned to look at her, she began to cry. Kilrogo stared at her tears, his face strangely empty of expression. No, he said. He lifted his hand and rubbed away the tears roughly with a calloused thumb. You speak the common tongue, Danny said in wonder. No, he said again. Perhaps he had only that word, she thought, but it was one word more than she had known he had, and somehow it made her feel a little better. Drogo touched her hair lightly, sliding the silver blonde strands between his fingers and murmuring softly in Dothraki. Danny did not understand the words, yet there was warmth in the tone, a tenderness she had never expected from this man. He put his finger under her chin and lifted her head, so she was looking up into his eyes. Drogo towered over her as he towered over everyone. Taking her lightly under the arms, he lifted her and seated her on a rounded rock beside the stream. Then he sat on the ground facing her, legs crossed beneath him, their faces finally at a height. No, he said. Is that the only word you know? She asked him. Drogo did not reply. His long heavy braid was coiled in the dirt beside him. He pulled it over his right shoulder and began to remove the bells from his hair, one by one. After a moment Danny leaned forward to help. When they were done, Drogo gestured. She understood. Slowly, carefully, she began to undo his braid. It took a long time. All the while he sat there silently, watching her. When she was done, he shook his head, and his hair spread out behind him like a river of darkness oiled and gleaming. She had never seen hair so long, so black, 
so thick. Then it was his turn. He began to undress her. His fingers were deft and strangely tender. He removed her silks one by one, carefully, while Danny sat unmoving, silent, looking at his eyes. When he bared her small breasts, she could not help herself. She averted her eyes and covered herself with her hands. No, Drogo said. He pulled her hands away from her breasts, gently but firmly, then lifted her face again to make her look at him. No, he repeated. No, she echoed back at him. He stood her up then and pulled her close to remove the last of her silks. The night air was chilly on her bare skin. She shivered, and goose flesh covered her arms and legs. She was afraid of what would come next, but for a while nothing happened. Klrogo sat with his legs crossed, looking at her, drinking in her body with his eyes. After a while he began to touch her. Lightly at first, then harder. She could sense the fierce strength in his hands, but he never hurt her. He held her hand in his own and brushed her fingers, one by one. He ran a hand gently down her leg. He stroked her face, tracing the curve of her ears, running a finger gently around her mouth. He put both hands in her hair and combed it with his fingers. He turned her around, massaged her shoulders, slid a knuckle down the path of her spine. It seemed as if hours passed before his hands finally went to her breasts. He stroked the soft skin underneath until it tingled. He circled her nipples with his thumbs, pinched them between thumb and forefinger, then began to pull at her, very lightly at first, then more insistently, until her nipples stiffened and began to ache. He stopped then, and drew her down onto his lap. Danny was flushed and breathless, her heart fluttering in her chest. He cupped her face in his huge hands and looked into his eyes. No? He said, and she knew it was a question. She took his hand and moved it down to the wetness between her thighs. Yes, she whispered as she put his finger inside her. Ended. The summons came in the hour before the dawn, when the world was still and grey. Alan shook him roughly from his dreams and Nedda stumbled into the bread or chill, groggy from sleep, to find his horse saddled and the king already mounted. Robert wore thick brown gloves and a heavy fur cloak with a hood that covered his ears, and looked for all the world like a bear sitting a horse. Up, Stark! He roared. Up, up! We have matters of state to discuss. By all means, Nedda said. Come inside. Your Grace. Alan lifted the flap of the tent. No, 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 Robert said. His breath steamed with every word. The camp is full of ears. Besides, I want to ride out and taste this country of yours. Cerberus and Sir Meron waited behind him with a dozen guardsmen, Nedisaw. There was nothing to do but rub the sleep from his eyes, dress, and mount up. Robert set the pace driving his huge black destrier hard as Ned galloped along beside him, trying to keep up. He called out a question as they rode, but the wind blew his words away, and the king did not hear him. After that Ned rode in silence. They soon left the king's road and took off across rolling plains dark with mist. By then the guard had fallen back a small distance, safely out of earshot, but still Robert would not slow. Dawn broke as they crested a low ridge, and finally the king pulled up. By then they were miles south of the main party. Robert was flushed and exhilarated as Ned reined up beside him. Gods, he swore, laughing, it feels good to get out and ride the way a man was meant to ride. I swear, Ned, this creeping along is enough to drive a man mad. He had never been a patient man, Robert Baratheon. That damnable wheelhouse. The way it creaks and groans, climbing every bump in the road as if it were a mountain. Dot. I promise you, if that wretched thing breaks another axle, I'm going to burn it, and so I can walk. Ned laughed. I will gladly light the torch for you. Good man. The king clapped him on the shoulder. I've half a mind to leave them all behind and just keep going. A smile touched Ned's lips. I do believe you mean it. I do, I do, the king said. What do you say, Ned? 
just you and me, two vagabond knights on the king's road, our swords at our sides and the gods know what in front of us, and maybe a farmer's daughter or a tavern wench to warm our beds tonight. Would that we could, Nedda said, but we have duties now, my liege. Dot. To the realm, to our children, I to my lady wife and you to your queen. We are not the boy as we were. You were never the boy you were, Robert grumbled. More's the pity. And yet there was that one time. Dot. What was her name, that common girl of yours? Becca? No, she was one of mine. Gods love her, black hair and these sweet big eyes, you could drown in them. Yours was. Dot. Aelina? Number. You told me once. Was it Merrill? You know the one I mean, your bastard's mother? Her name was Wyla, Ned replied with cool courtesy, and I would sooner not speak of her. Wyla. Yes. The king grinned. She must have been a rare wench if she could make Lord Eddard Stark forget his honor, even for an hour. You never told me what she looked like. Dot. Ned's mouth tightened in anger. Nor will I. Leave it be, Robert, for the love you say you bear me. I dishonored myself and I dishonored Catelyn, in the sight of gods and men. Gods have mercy, you scarcely knew Catelyn. I had taken her to wife. She was carrying my child. You are too hard on yourself, Ned. You always were. Damn it, no woman wants Bella the blessed in her bed. He slapped a hand on his knee. Well, I'll not press you if you feel so strong about it, though I swear, at times you're so prickly you ought to take the hedgehog as your sigil. The rising sun sent fingers of light through the pale white mists of dawn. A wide plain spread out beneath them, bare and brown, its flatness here and there relieved by long, low hummocks. Ned pointed them out to his king. The barrows of the first men. Robert frowned. Have we ridden on to a graveyard? There are barrows everywhere in the north, your grace, Ned told him. This land is old. And cold, Robert grumbled, pulling his cloak more tightly around himself. The guard had reined up well behind them, at the bottom of the ridge. Well, I did not bring you out here to talk of graves or bicker about your bastard. There was a rider in the night from a lord varies in King's Landing. Here. The king pulled a paper from his belt and handed it to Ned. Varys the eunuch was the king's master of whisperers. He served Robert now as he had once served Ares Targaryen. Ned unrolled the paper with trepidation, thinking of Lyza and her terrible accusation, but the message did not concern Lady Arryn. What is the source for this information? Do you remember Sir Jerome Mormont? Would that I might forget him, Nedda said bluntly. The Mormonts of Bear Island were an old house, proud and honorable, but their lands were cold and distant and poor. Sir Jira had tried to swell the family coffers by selling some poachers to a Tyroshi slaver. As the Mormonts were bannermen to the Starks, his crime had dishonored the North. Ned had made the long journey west to Bear Island only to find when he arrived that Jura had taken ship beyond the reach of ice and the king's justice. Five years had passed since then. Sir Jura is now in Pentos, anxious to earn a royal pardon that would allow him to return from exile, Robert explained. Lord Varys makes good use of him. So the slaver has become a spy, Nedda said with distaste. He handed the letter back. I would rather he become a corpse. Varys tells me that spies are more useful than corpses, Robert said. Juru aside, what do you make of his report? Daenerys Targaryen has wed a some Dothraki horse lord. What of it? Shall we send her a wedding gift? The king frowned. A knife, perhaps. A good sharp one, and a bold man to wield it. Ned did not feign surprise, Robert's hatred of the Targaryens was a madness in him. He remembered the angry words they had exchanged when Tywin Lannister had presented Robert with the corpses of Ragger's wife and children as a token of fealty. Ned had named that murder, Robert called it war. When he had protested that the young prince and princess were no more than babes, his new-made king had replied, 
I see no babes. Only dragon spawn. Not even Jonarin had been able to calm that storm. Eddard Stark had ridden out that very day in a cold rage, to fight the last battles of the war alone in the south. It had taken another death to reconcile them, Lyanna's death, and the grief they had shared over her passing. This time, Ned resolved to keep his temper. Your grace, the girl is scarcely more than a child. You are no Tywin Lannister, to slaughter innocents. It was said that Raga's little girl had cried as they dragged her from beneath her bed to face the swords. The boy had been no more than a babe in arms, yet Lord Tywin's soldiers had torn him from his mother's breast and dashed his head against a wall. And how long will this one remain an innocent? Robert's mouth grew hard. This child will soon enough spread her legs and start breeding more dragon spawn to plague me. Nonetheless, Nedda said. The murder of children. Dot. It would be vile. Dot. Unspeakable. Dot. Unspeakable? The king roared. What Ares did to your brother Brandon was unspeakable. The way your lord father died, that was unspeakable. And Raga. Dot. How many times do you think he raped your sister? How many hundreds of times? His voice had grown so loud that his horse whinnied nervously beneath him. The king jerked the reins hard, quieting the animal, and pointed an angry finger at Ned. I will kill every Targaryen I can get my hands on, until they are as dead as their dragons, and then I will piss on their graves. Ned knew better than to defy him when the wrath was on him. If the years had not quenched Robert's thirst for revenge, no words of his would help. You can't get your hands on this one, can you? He said quietly. The king's mouth twisted in a bitter grimace. No. Gods be cursed. Some pox-ridden Pentoshi cheesemonger had her brother and her walled up on his estate with pointy-hatted eunuchs all around them, and now he's handed them over to the Dothraki. I should have had them both killed years ago, when it was easy to get at them, but John was as bad as you. More fool I. I listened to him. Jonarin was a wise man and a good hand. Robert snorted. The anger was leaving him as suddenly as it had come. This Kldrogo is said to have a hundred thousand men in his horde. What would John say to that? He would say that even a million Dothraki are no threat to the realm, so long as they remain on the other side of the narrow sea, Ned replied calmly. The barbarians have no ships. They hate and fear the open sea. The king shifted uncomfortably in his saddle. Perhaps. There are ships to be had in the free cities, though. I tell you, Ned, I do not like this marriage. There are still those in the Seven Kingdoms who call me usurper. Do you forget how many houses fought for Targaryen in the war? They bide their time for now, but give them half a chance, they will murder me in my bed and my sons with me. If the beggar king crosses with a Dothraki horde at his back, the traitors will join him. He will not cross, Ned promised. And if by some mischance he does, we will throw him back into the sea. Once you choose a new warden of the east, the king groaned. For the last time, I will not name the Arin boy warden. I know the boy is your nephew, but with Targaryens climbing in bed with Dothraki, I would be mad to rest one quarter of the realm on the shoulders of a sickly child. Ned was ready for that. Yet we still must have a warden of the east. If Robert Arryn will not do, name one of your brothers. Stannis proved himself at the Siege of Storm's End, surely? He let the name hang there for a moment. The king frowned and said nothing. He looked uncomfortable. That is, Ned finished quietly, watching unless you have already promised the honor to another. For a moment Robert had the grace to look startled. Just as quickly, the look became annoyance. What if I have? It's Jaime Lannister, is it not? Robert kicked his horse back into motion and started down the ridge toward the barrows. Ned kept pace with him. The king rode on, eyes straight ahead. Yes, he said at last. A single hard word to end the matter. King's Lair, Nedda said. The rumors were true, then. He rode on dangerous ground now, he knew. 
an able and courageous man, no doubt, he said carefully, but his father is Warden of the West, Robert. In time Sir Jaime will succeed to that honor. No one man should hold both East and West. He left unsaid his real concern, that the appointment would put half the armies of the realm into the hands of Lannisters. I will fight that battle when the enemy appears on the field, the king said stubbornly. At the moment, Lord Tywin looms eternal as Casterly Rock, so I doubt that Jaime will be succeeding any time soon. Don't vex me about this, Ned, the stone has been set. Your Grace, may I speak frankly? I seem unable to stop you, Robert grumbled. They rode through tall brown grasses. Can you trust Jaime Lannister? He is my wife's twin, a sworn brother of the King's Guard, his life and fortune and honor all bound to mine. As they were bound to Ares Targaryens, Ned pointed out. Why should I mistrust him? He has done everything I have ever asked of him. His sword helped win the throne I sit on. His sword helped taint the throne you sit on, Ned thought, but he did not permit the words to pass his lips. He swore a vow to protect his king's life with his own. Then he opened that king's throat with a sword. Seven hells, someone had to kill Ares. Robert said, reining his mount to a sudden halt beside an ancient barrow. If Jaime hadn't done it, it would have been left for you or me. We were not sworn brothers of the king's guard, Nedda said. The time had come for Robert to hear the whole truth, he decided then and there. Do you remember the trident, your grace? I won my crown there. How should I forget it? You took a wound from Raga, Ned reminded him. So when the Targaryen host broke and ran, you gave the pursuit into my hands. The remnants of Raga's army fled back to King's Landing. We followed. Ares was in the Red Keep with several thousand loyalists. I expected to find the gates closed to us. Robert gave an impatient shake of his head. Instead you found that our men had already taken the city. What of it? Not our men, Nedda said patiently. Lannister men. The Lion of Lannister flew over the ramparts, not the crowned stag. And they had taken the city by treachery. The war had raged for close to a year. Lords great and small had flocked to Robert's banners, others had remained loyal to Dargaer. The mighty Lannisters of Casterly Rock, the Wardens of the West, had remained aloof from the struggle, ignoring calls to arms from both rebels and royalists. Ares Targaryen must have thought that his gods had answered his prayers when Lord Tywin Lannister appeared before the gates of King's Landing with an army twelve thousand strong, professing loyalty. So the Mad King had ordered his last mad act. He had opened his city to the lions at the gate. Treachery was a coin the Targaryens knew well, Robert said. The anger was building in him again. Lannister paid them back in kind. It was no less than they deserved. I shall not trouble my sleep over it. You were not there, Nedda said, bitterness in his voice. Troubled sleep was no stranger to him. He had lived his lies for fourteen years, yet they still haunted him at night. There was no honor in that conquest. The others take your honor. Robert swore. What did any Targaryen ever know of honor? Go down into your crypt and ask Lyanna about the dragon's honor. You avenged Lyanna at the trident, Nedda said, halting beside the king. Promise me, Ned, she had whispered. That did not bring her back. Robert looked away, off into the grey distance. The gods be damned. It was a hollow victory they gave me. A crown. Dot. It was the girl I prayed them for. Your sister, safe. Dot. And mine again, as she was meant to be. I ask you, Ned, what good is it to wear a crown? The gods mock the prayers of kings and cowherds alike. I cannot answer for the gods, your grace. Dot. Only for what I found when I rode into the throne room that day, Nedda said. Ares was dead on the floor, drowned in his own blood. His dragon skulls stared down from the walls. Lannister's men were everywhere. Jaime wore the white cloak of the king's guard over his golden armor. I can see him still. 
Even his sword was gilded. He was seated on the iron throne, high above his knights, wearing a helm fashioned in the shape of a lion's head. How he glittered! This is well known, the king complained. I was still mounted. I rode the length of the hall in silence, between the long rows of dragon skulls. It felt as though they were watching me, somehow. I stopped in front of the throne, looking up at him. His golden sword was across his legs, its edge red with the king's blood. My men were filling the room behind me. Lannister's men drew back. I never said a word. I looked at him seated there on the throne, and I waited.